Hello everyone, if you are a Blender user and you want to learn Unreal Engine 5, then this tutorial is made for you. In this tutorial, we're going to go over Unreal Engine 5, but with a focus on its similarities and differences with Blender. That's how you're able to take your Blender skills and easily transfer them over into Unreal. Also, at the very end of this video, we're going to create this beautiful world you see right now. Completely from scratch, start to finish. Now, this video is pretty long, but I've divided it up into individual lessons, so you could go at your own pace. In this tutorial, you will learn how to navigate your 3D world and move objects, create materials using the shader graph, and most importantly, how to export your Blender creations and bring them into Unreal. We will also go over Unreal's brand new lighting system called Lumen, and how to import Nanai assets from Epic Games' Megascans library. And at the end, we will put together everything we learned to create an ancient shrine environment dedicated to the Blender monkey head and an alternative night lighting version of it. So without further ado, let's jump into UE5. Before we can use Unreal Engine, of course, we have to download it. We can download UE5 through the Epic Games launcher. You can get the Epic Games launcher on Epic Games website. Now, once you have the launcher, you want to click on the UE5 tab right here and click on download early access. It might take a while, but once you do have UE5 downloaded, come to library and simply click on launch. But before we click on launch, an alternative to open up Unreal Engine, that's how we don't have to keep on going through the Epic Games launcher, is to click on the drop down right there and click on create a shortcut. This will create a little shortcut for Unreal Engine 5, and we can simply double click on it to launch UE5 from our desktop. The Unreal Project Browser will open up. From here, you could create new projects or open up recent projects as you can see right here, but this will probably be empty for you. To create a new project, we can select from a couple of pre-made templates by Epic Games. So for example, maybe if you're in the automotive industry and you're trying to do some car renders, you'd come down here and you would select this template. Essentially, templates are pre-made projects Epic Games has made with some common use functionalities. But for our purposes as beginners, I'm just going to select a completely blank project from games, blank. We can click on the button right here to select a new location where our project will be created. I'm just going to click on my desktop for now. Let's select folder and we can name this project something. Let's just call this first project. And then I want to make sure starter content is turned on. Starter content will give us some pre-made assets that we can use to help our learning experience. Also, we could choose a target platform. I'm just going to leave it at desktop. We're going to leave it at blueprint we're not going to be going over c in this tutorial because then this tutorial will be 10 hours long and then i'm gonna make sure ray trace is unchecked and click create this is what you should see when you're opening up unreal for the first time with the starter content but before we even touch unreal engine notice if i minimize unreal engine that we have a new folder on our desktop this new folder is our unreal project double click on it we'll open up the folder and we can see all the assets and data that make up our Unreal project. And let's maximize our project. And we're gonna real quickly exit out of the project. To reopen our project, we could go through the Unreal project browser, or we can directly click on the project by opening up its project folder and double clicking on the .u project. You want to make sure that you're selecting the Unreal Engine version you are using. Of course, this is an Unreal Engine 5 tutorial. So we're gonna select five, press okay to open our Unreal project we created back up. So to begin, probably what catches your attention is this middle window right here. This middle window is our 3D viewport. Our 3D viewport allows us to change and manipulate our level and to also view our level. Now, don't worry, we're gonna go over how you can navigate your camera around and move objects in just a bit, but we're gonna real quickly go over what some of these windows are doing. So to begin, up above here, we have the toolbar. The toolbar essentially allows us to have access to some commonly used tools and switch our modes. For example, let's say if you want to create a landscape, I could come up here and select landscape mode. And now I'm in landscape editing mode. We don't have a landscape, so you're going to ask me to create one. We will go over landscapes later in the video. Or if I want to paint foliage like trees and grass, we also have a paint mode. So let's go out of that. And we can even create objects by clicking on the create tab right here. When I click on the Create tab, let's say maybe I want a sphere in my world. Let's come to Shapes and simply drag in a sphere just like this. Now, I don't want the sphere in here, so I'm going to click on the Delete key to get rid of that object. And speaking of objects, a way to see all the objects in your world 
is of course with the world outliner. The world outliner is very similar to Blender's outliner in that it shows all the objects that exist in our 3D viewport. So for example, we can see that when I click on a chair right here, that chair is also selected on the world outliner. Or if I select an object in the world outliner, that was selected in the 3D viewport. Real quickly, if you want to create a folder, we can just right click and click on create folder. Let's call this one chairs. And then I can select multiple objects by holding down shift or control and simply dragging them into the chair folder, letting go just like that. So now we have a new folder. And if you ever want to hide and unhide objects or folders, I could click on the eye icon right there to hide and unhide. Now, what happens if you want to change the properties of an object? Well, we could do so with the details panel down here. So let's say maybe I want this table right there to be a little bit longer then I could change its scale on the X axis from one to two. But now that change looks a little bit stupid. So we can always undo any changes by pressing control and Z just like in blender. And if we come down here, we see that we have a bunch of different properties that we can edit. Don't worry. While we will be going over what some of these properties do, the vast majority we're never going to even touch. So at this point, you might be wondering, where is everything stored? Where are this table, chairs, and all the props? Where is this level being saved? Well, everything in your Unreal Engine project is contained within your content browser. And you can open up your content browser by coming down here and left-clicking on this icon in the far left-hand corner. And our content browser will pop up. We can also press Control and Space. So that's Control, Space at the same exact time to bring it up as a shortcut. So our content browser is very similar to File Explorer where we have a bunch of folders and in these folders is content and assets. So for example, if I click on props, we can see that we have our chairs, tables, and 3D objects. I can hold down the left mouse button to drag out an object just like this and press the delete key to delete that. Or I can double click on any of these assets to open up that assets editor. We will go over what this is in just a bit to make some changes directly to that asset. Also, if I come to maps, we can see that we have minimal underscore default. That's the same name as minimal underscore default up here. If I double click on this, it's going to ask me to say, let's save. We can see that we open up the same exact map. So this is where our default map is being saved. And if you don't see the chairs, tables, or this starter content folder in general, that's because you forgot to check starter content when you created your project. Now, don't worry if you ever do forget to check starter content and you do want some of the content within that, you want to click on the add button. Add feature content pack, go to content packs and select starter content and then click on add to project. But we already have this in our project, so I'll just exit out. Now, what if you get tired of pressing control and space all the time to get our content browser? Well, we can dock our content browser into our user interface by clicking on the dock and layout button right there. So now it's a window just like all the other windows. And before we go over more features of the content browser, let's go over how we could customize our user interface and move our windows around. So if you don't like the position of a window and you want to move it, you need to come over to the tab of that window and hold down the left mouse button. So now we can see that I can drag this around and let's say maybe I could dock it to the left or I can even dock it right here. So have multiple tabs right next to each other. That's how I can switch in between them just like this. Now we can left click, hold and drag and maybe just let go in the middle right here. And now we have a floating window. If you ever want to get rid of a window, then we could click on the X icon or you can hover your mouse over a tab and press the middle mouse button as a shortcut. If you want to get back a window, then we could come up to windows right here and we have access to a bunch of different windows. So generally, and you will see this happen throughout this tutorial, I like to click on world settings and world settings will automatically be docked next to the details panel. And that is exactly what I want. Sometimes a window won't have a tab and that's because that tab is collapsed. To collapse a tab, you need to right click on that tab and then click on collapse the tab well, just like that. So now we can see that our tab is gone and we get a little bit more real estate. And if you wanna get back that tab, we have a very small little blue triangle. Click on the blue triangle and our tab is back. So right click to collapse, click on the triangle to bring back our tab. And we can see for our 3D viewport at the top left hand corner that we can even move this viewport around just like this. And now just leave it like that. We can see that maybe our user interface has been ruined to the point of no return 
do not worry we can always reload unreal's default user interface by coming up to window down to load and select default editor layout and we get back our default ui now that we're done with the user interface let's jump back to the content browser so let's go press Control space to bring it up and i'm just going to dock it in the layout and let's go over how unreal organizes a project compared to blender so blender files operate off of a process called linking Essentially, a Blender file can link and use an asset located somewhere on your computer disk. This is great because multiple Blender files can share the same asset. These assets can be anything from textures to sound to even other Blender files. Because Blender projects share assets, they don't take up a lot of space, which is great, but it is easy to break links. You've broken links beforehand if your scene has ever turned into a nasty pink. In contrast, Unreal does not link. Instead, it takes an asset, converts it into a .u asset, and stores that asset in the content folder of your project. A .u asset could be many different things, from textures, to sound, to 3D models and materials. If it's in the content browser, it's a u asset. This is good because you don't have to worry about the location of assets, but your project will end up being many gigabytes. The UE5 demo project, which you can download from the Epic Games launcher, is about 100 gigabytes large. So do expect Unreal products to be pretty big. Now let's go over a practical example to get a better sense of Unreal's content system. So let's make our content browser really big. And I'm going to move this window off to the side. We can see on my desktop, I have a very simple FBX 3D model if we double click on it. We can see that it's the default Suzanne Blender monkey head. So very simple mesh. And let's open up our project folder, double click, and we can see all the folders that make up the current project I have opened. And we'll notice that we have a content folder. Double clicking on this content folder, you'll see we have a folder called starter content. Then if I click on the starter content, we get a bunch of folders. Clicking on this starter content, we get the same exact folders. Essentially, our content browser in Unreal is just taking the information from the content folder in my main project. So double clicking on, let's just say architecture and architecture here. We can see that all the meshes right here line up with all the .u assets. So we have a pillar that's 50 by 500. Same thing right here, a pillar that's 50 by 500. Even if we go into audio right here and let's exit out, let's go into audio. We can see even all the audios are .u assets. So if there's an asset and it exists in the content browser, then that's being stored on your disk as a .u asset. So what happens if I let's go out into the starter content, drag in the monkey head directly into my content folder? We will see nothing actually happens. But in the bottom right hand corner, Unreal is saying a change to source content file has been detected. Would you like to import it? So essentially, Unreal is going to ask us, hey, we noticed that there's an FBX file within your content folder. How about you change that into a .u asset? Let's click on don't import because I want to show the correct way to bring in an object. Drag out the monkey head. And instead of dragging it into the content folder in our disk, I'm going to drag it into the content browser of our actual project. Let go. We get a bunch of FBX import options. Don't worry about any of these options. We will go over them in just a bit but I'm just gonna select on do not create material and import. Now we can see that we do have a monkey head within our project, double click on it. The mesh is looking all right. And now within our content folder, I need to refresh. I need to save. So press control and S. And now we can see that we have a monkey head dot U asset. So what happened was that it took the FBX file and it converted it into a dot U asset storing it within our content folder. Now we are finally done with all of that techno mumbo jumbo. I know that was boring, but it is essential. You know how Unreal organizes projects because it's very different from Blender and new users often get confused. On to the fun stuff, and that is navigating our 3D world. So let's just get rid of my content browser by hovering over the tab and middle mouse button because we can always press control and space to bring that up. So navigating in Unreal Engine is a little bit different from Blender. While Blender is pivot based, so you're essentially rolling around a specific object by default, Unreal is more game based. What I mean is that the controls of Unreal 
are very similar to that of a first person shooter. So if you want to look around, you can see that if you start moving your mouse, your camera isn't looking around. But as soon as you hold down the right mouse button, so holding down the right mouse button, we are then able to pivot our camera around. And with the right mouse button still held down, we can use WASD to move. So W to go forward, S to go backwards, A to go to the left, and D to go to the right. Just like any first person shooter, and in order to activate those controls, you need to make sure your right mouse button is held down. Right mouse button is essentially the activator to move the camera around. And if you want to go up or down, you use E to go up and Q to go down. So WASD, E and Q while still holding the right mouse button. We can control the speed of our camera by coming up here in the top right hand corner and clicking on the camera speed button. Right now by default, it's set to four. We can set this to something, let's go really small like one. And now we're just inching around or we could do something ridiculous like eight and fly super far away. So I'm gonna set my speed back to four and oftentimes you will find yourself lost. Uh-oh, like where's the bulk of my creations? Where's the rest of the world? Well, that is absolutely fine. What we can do is jump back to any of our objects in the world outliner. So I get to select the floor and press the F key to snap to that object's location. This is called focusing. So let's say if I want to focus on the statue right here, I could just click it and press F to snap to that statue. Likewise, an alternative is to double click on an object. So if I'm really far away, instead of pressing F to focus, I can double click on that object in the world outliner to also snap to it. The shortcut to changing your camera speed on the fly is to hold down the right mouse button, of course, and use the scroll wheel. So right mouse button scroll wheel up will make the camera faster or right mouse button scroll wheel down will make the camera even slower, which is just an alternative to clicking on the button up here. Now, at this point, you know how to navigate in Unreal. It's just the WASD keys and E to go up and Q to go down. But what if you want to navigate the way you do in Blender by pivoting and rotating around an object? Well, we could do that by first focusing on an object. So let's select this table, press F, and then I want to hold down the Alt key and the left mouse button. So hold down Alt, left mouse button at the same time, move your mouse, and we can see now we're rotating, pivoting around an object, just like how we would do by default in Blender. And if I hold down the Alt key again and hold down the right mouse button, we can see I can zoom in and out. So Alt, right mouse button, zoom in and out, Alt, left to pivot around. Let's select an object like this chair, press F, focus on it, hold down Alt, left mouse button, pivot around, and Alt, right mouse button to zoom in and out. So you do have some options of navigating in Unreal. And I tend to alternate between the two depending on what I need. Now that we know how to navigate our world, it's important to go over the different viewport options of our 3D world before we jump into moving around objects. So first off, you might be wondering, how do I go into orthographic view mode just like in Blender? Well, up here we have perspective and then we can see we have all our different orthographic viewports. So I can look at from a top perspective and by default, Unreal will automatically put us in a wireframe mode. If I don't want wireframe mode, I could change that. So right here, let's just do lit. Or we can click on top, go from the left, right, bottom. Essentially, we have everything you would expect. It is a little bit glitchy right now. That is expected since Unreal Engine 5 is in early access. But the controls for our orthographic view mode is to hold down the right mouse button to pan and use a scroll wheel to zoom in and out. So scroll wheel, zoom, right mouse button, pan. Pretty simple. And if we ever want to get out of our orthographic view mode, of course, we can click right here and click perspective. But notice for a lot of these settings, we have a shortcut right here next to it. So it looks like the shortcut for perspective is Alt and G. So that means if we press Alt G, that will automatically bring me into perspective. So that's pretty nice. Now, one of the shortcuts I'm going to use often is the G key. That's because... If we click right here on these three lines to get some more settings, we can see that we have game view. Essentially game view will allow us to see what the actual player or render or animation will see. Because of course, 
if we're gonna render out this scene, then you wouldn't expect us to see this sun widget right here, which represents our sun value. Instead, you would expect to see, let's go back into our settings, click on game view to activate it, something like this. So it just gets rid of all those widgets and the shortcut is G. It also gets rid of, hopefully you can see it, this grid right here. So pressing G, no more grid, no more widgets. This is what our player or animation would see. So just know subconsciously, I'm gonna be pressing the G key a lot just to go back and forth from my game view to editing view. Now let's come up here to lit and we can see we have a bunch of view modes. View modes are great for debugging. Let's say maybe you know something's wrong with the lighting, then we could click on detail lighting only and see exactly what the issue is. We could even see our wireframes or what the scene looks completely unlit. So just look at our base colors. And we will see that we do have some shortcuts. So the default lighting is Alt 4 to get back to lit view mode. But we can do Alt 3 to go to unlit, Alt 2 wireframe, and so forth. Now we're going to go over exposure in just a bit. So hang in there. But right next to lit are the show flags. So show flags essentially allows us to turn on and off different rendering properties. So maybe you don't want to see this grid right here. I'm going to press G to toggle off game view mode to see our grid. I can click on show and right here for grid, I could turn it off just like that. So oftentimes if you're in Unreal Engine and maybe you don't see fog or maybe your landscape isn't showing up, make sure they aren't deactivated in the show flags. And you can always bring back your default show flags by clicking on use defaults just like that. And finally, what if you want a better view of your viewport? Well, you get a little bit more real estate by pressing F10 if you do have F10 on your keyboard, which will then collapse the windows on the side right here. So maybe I don't want my world outliner or details. I just want to focus on this middle window, pressing F10, move everything to the side. And now if I want my details panel again, I can just click on details and then click away and we can see those windows automatically go away. So that's a pretty neat feature. It's kind of like pressing control space, but for other windows. And let's press F10 to bring those back. If I want to go full screen, then that's what F11 is for. So now we have a full screen view and pressing F11 again, go out of full screen. Now it is finally, finally time to go over how we can move and create objects. So this is going to be really fun. Let's zoom in on this chair right here and maybe make the details panel just a little bit bigger. And to move an object, all you have to do is select on that object and you should see a pivot. Now, right now, the default pivot is on the move. Now, if you don't see move, you want to come up here and you want to make sure you select translate. So now that we have this pivot, you can probably guess what each arrow does. I can move it on the X axis, move it on the Y axis and Z axis. Another thing I can do is hover my mouse over the square in between the Y and the X arrows and lock it on that axis, completely ignoring the Z axis. So I can even move it on two different axes separate from each other. But by default, when you do open up an Unreal Engine project, you'll notice that snapping is turned on. So up here we can see it's set to 10. That means it's snapping every 10 centimeters. Now, if I want to snap every meter, then we're going to change it from 10 centimeters to 100. Now we can see that my grid even got bigger and now I'm moving it every one meter. If I don't even want any snapping, then I can select this button right here, turn that white, and we get a smooth translation and our grid is a little bit too big. So let's move that back to 10. It is pretty important to know that Unreal goes by centimeters. So one Unreal unit is one centimeter. For example, this chair right now, if we look at its location on the X axis, it's at negative 54. That means it's negative 54 centimeters away from the world origin point. And in fact, you can measure objects by going into orthographic view mode. So let's go left and zoom in on this chair. I'm gonna hold down the middle mouse button and with the middle mouse button held down, we can get this ruler. I could come down and we can see that this chair is exactly 120 centimeters tall or 1.2 meters. So that's translation. What about rotation? 
Well, coming up to here, right next to the translation tool, we have the rotation. So we can select it right there. And now we can see that I can rotate it along all the different axes. And it's right now snapping every 10 degrees. We can, of course, just like beforehand, turn off snapping by coming up here and making that icon white. And we can change the snapping degrees. So instead of snapping every 10, we can even do 45 or 90. And now we have a very smooth rotation. Let's press Control Z to undo those. And finally, we have scale. So scale tool is right next to rotation. And of course, as you can guess, we can scale it and it looks like it is snapping by default. So we could turn off snapping by coming up to this icon and clicking it. So now we get smooth scaling. I could scale it on different individual axes or I can scale it on all the axes by hovering my mouse over the white box in the middle. And now we are uniformly scaling. So let's press Control and Z. And the shortcuts, if we hover our mouse over any of these tools, we can see that translation is W, rotation is E, and scaling is R. So W to move, E to rotate, and R to scale. It is going to be a while until you get used to it, switching in between these different pivots, but eventually you will, and it will be pretty fast. So once again, that's W to move, E to rotate, and R to scale uniformly. So press Control and Z. If you ever forget what a shortcut is for one of these buttons, just hover your mouse over them and Unreal will tell you. Now, what if we want to move an object on its local axis? Then I'm going to come here and instead of the globe or global axis, we can switch it to local space. So we can see, especially if I have the translation pivot turned on, that when I switch in between the two, right here we're moving in the world x-axis. Clicking the button, we are now moving in the direction of the chair. So just like in Blender, we can switch in between global space and local space. If you ever want to create a new object, then we could come up to create and drag in some simple objects like a cone, or we can even drag in lights right here. So drag in a point light, and now we have a new light source. I must select my light, delete it, select the cone, and let's delete it. Now, what if you want to create an object from your content browser? Well, press Control Space to bring up our content browser, and let's navigate to props. And within props, let's drag out sm underscore couch. And we can see we just brought in a brand new mesh. And maybe let's try to decorate this more. Let's add in sm underscore lamp ceiling. But we don't have a ceiling, so let's turn this around, rotate it. That's how it looks like a torch. Press E to bring up rotation. And we could rotate this to try to get it to 180 degrees. Or press Control Z. We can make sure that we're rotating it exactly 180 degrees by locking it to 90 degrees and turning on snapping. So now when I do move it, it snaps every 90 degrees. And let's try to move this down. So I can try to guesstimate. That's how the vertices are just hitting the floor. Or if I want to snap an object down to the floor or whatever object is below it, I can hit the END key. So the END key on my keyboard. So I'll click on END and that will snap it down. When I've said that before, a lot of people get confused and think it's the END key, but it's the END END key. So make sure you are pressing the right one and maybe press R and just scale this up just a bit. Now at this point, I want another lamp that's of the same rotation and scale. So what I could do is open up my content browser, drag in another lamp, rotate it, scale it, and so on. Or we can just duplicate this lamp right here. So to duplicate, it's pretty simple. You just press Control C, Control V. Nothing really happens right now. That's because there are two lamps overlapping each other. If we drag, we can see that we had two of them. Now a shortcut, that's why we don't have to press Control C and Control V again, is Control and W. So Control W will copy and paste in place. And now we have another lamp that way. But personally, the way I like to duplicate objects is pretty unique. Essentially, we want to click on our object and hold down Alt. So with Alt held down, 
Now we can drag from any of these arrows in translation mode, and we can see that we get a new one. So let go of Alt and left mouse button, hold down Alt again, and drag again to duplicate. So there are three ways to duplicate an object. You can go Control C, Control V, Control W, or just hold down Alt and drag. So let's delete these lamps. I think I'm going to leave one in my level. And let's create a long table. So I'm going to delete this couch and also delete that chair right there. So let's grab that chair, hold down Alt and duplicate it. E and rotate it. Okay, we still have nine degrees. So I'm going to turn off snapping and we can select multiple objects by holding down shift. So with one object selected, hold down shift and select another one. If you ever want to deselect an object, you can hold down control and click like that. So holding down shift to select multiple objects, hold down control to deselect multiple objects. So let's hold down shift. Let's select that one right there. And we will duplicate it by holding down alt and dragging. In between each duplication, I stop holding down the alt and left mouse button. And then when I want to duplicate again, I hold down alt and left mouse button again. So you have to take your hand off the keyboard to keep on duplicating. I've rotated these chairs, that's how they're facing the middle. And let's grab this table, scale it with R, rotate it with E. And position it in the middle just a bit. W to move the statue. R, let's make this statue just a little bit bigger by scaling uniformly. And let's select these lamps right here. Let's move it. That's how there's one right there. And a lot of these editor widgets are really getting in my way right now. So I'm going to press G to hide those and go into game view. Hold down Alt. Let's duplicate those lamps. Shift, select multiple. Hold down Alt again. And simply drag them across my level. So here's a nice tip. Whenever you're dragging an object using the translation widget, you could hold down shift while dragging to lock your camera. So maybe if you want to drag an object really far away, it's outside the camera view, just hold down shift to lock your camera. And this is something I do all the time when creating my levels. And finally, one last adjustment. Let's rotate these chairs right here just a bit with E. That's how they are facing the table. Maybe move this one a little bit. And let's also rotate these. So congratulations, you made your first level in Unreal Engine 5. And honestly, this scene is not that good, but if you do want to save level, we could press Control and S, but Control and S will only save the map you're opened. If you are editing multiple assets, make sure you go to Content Drawer and click on Save All. Now there's nothing to save all, but if you did change multiple assets, it'll ask you to confirm that save, just click Yes. So probably while editing your map, you probably noticed something weird with the camera and that is it gets brighter and darker. For example, if we come down here underneath this table and if we look at the shadow, our scene gets brighter and brighter and brighter. But as soon as we go away, our scene gets darker. That's because Unreal Engine has auto exposure turned on by default. And auto exposure is pretty unique in that it tries to mimic the way the human eyes work. So the human eye will get brighter or darker, your pupils will dilate, depending on how much light is hitting it. And I know that might have sounded a bit complicated, but we will go over example in just a bit. Now, Blender does have exposure. We can see it right here under rendering settings, color management. We could play with the exposure value there. We see our scene gets brighter and brighter, brighter, or we can make it get darker and darker and darker until it's almost pitch black. But Blender does not have automatic exposure. And quite frankly, when I am editing in Unreal, Automatic exposure can be really annoying. But before we turn it off, let's go over why auto exposure can be helpful in some circumstances. Now I'm gonna make a major change to my map, but before I do so, sometimes I like to duplicate my map just to make a copy. So let's go to maps. And right now we're on minimal underscore default. We know we are because up here it says minimal underscore default. We can select any map and press control C and control V to duplicate that. Or the shortcut, just like in our viewport, we could press Control and W to copy and paste in place. And let's call this one Exposure Map. Just like that. And duplicate it. Let's save selected. And now we are editing a new map. We're editing the map we just copied called Exposure. So first off, we get this warning saying reflection captures need to be rebuilt. 
We will go over reflections in the lighting chapter, but for now I don't need them, so select these orbs and delete them. Now let's select this tile here, delete it, and I'm going to grab this floor, press R to scale, and I only want to scale it in the Y and X axis, so I'm going to hover over that line and simply scale it up like this, and also let's scale it just in the X. Let's add in some walls, so go to create, shapes, cube, drag the cube in there like this, and I'm going to scale it along the Y. Get rid of these editor widgets with G, because those are annoying. And just make a pretty thin wall. Duplicate this with Alt on the other side. And obviously this isn't perfect, because I'm just trying to demonstrate why auto exposure is pretty useful. Hold on Alt again. Want to rotate this 9 degrees, so turn on snapping. Make sure 9 degrees is selected. And now we can just snap to 9 degrees like that. So move that wall there. And hold on Alt. Duplicate. Let's make a really crappy door. Hold down Alt. And drag from here to duplicate it. Let's hold down Alt again. Drag it up like this. And rotate that 90 degrees. So that we have a little door. And finally... Hold down Alt, duplicate it, rotate it 9 degrees, and let's cover up this area. So, I'm going to scale it up and move it until we are completely covering up this roof. And the only sunlight is coming from the door right there. And now we see a perfect example of why auto exposure is amazing. So here we're in our room and you know, it looks pretty nice, looks realistic. Come outside, notice how the outdoors is no longer white. Our camera gets darker so we can see outdoors. And if we try to look into our room, our room seems pretty dark, but that's actually physically accurate because when I come inside, our pupils dilate, we let in more light and the room gets brighter. That's how we can actually see what we're working on. And this is just like in real life where if you're in a dark room all day, you hop outside into the bright light. You can feel your pupils getting smaller to take in less light. That's how you can see more detail and you're not blinded. This is why Unreal has auto exposure. It can be confusing for Blender users since Blender does not have that. But if we want to turn it off, we could come up to Lit, go down to Game Settings, uncheck that. And we have this slider under Game Settings. If we bring it down, our screen gets brighter. Or if we bring it up, our screen gets darker. So this is just a manual way to control our exposure. So let's go to zero. But there is one issue, and that is if I press play. Actually, let's move our player start. That's how it's outside. Now if I press play, we can see that auto exposure is still on by default. And that's because when we do change the exposure within our view modes, that's only changing the exposure for us, the editors, us, the people using our real engine. If we do render out animation or we play a game, then auto exposure will still be turned on. The way we turn off auto exposure is by adding a post process volume. So this is going to be something new, but let's come to create volumes and let's find the post process volume all the way down here and drag it out. We can see exactly what it is. It's just a cube. I need to increase this post process volume. That's how it encompasses my entire level or wherever my camera is. And let's move that up. Now within the post process volume and with it selected in the details panel, let's control the exposure within the drop down for exposure. Instead of auto exposure histogram, I want to click on this and set to manual. We also need to make sure that it is selected right here and turned on. Now notice when we do play with the exposure in the post-process volume, nothing is happening. That's because we have exposure in the post-process volume turned off within our view modes. So make sure game settings is turned on. And now when I play with the exposure compensation, we can see that change. And let's just make it really bright. For example, let's go to 14, press play. We can see that our post-process volume is affecting our player's point of view. And if we do render this out as animation, it's going to use the exposure from our post process. So let's leave it at 10 for now. 
know that our post process volume is only affecting the area that's within this cube. As soon as I come out, we can see that our exposure goes away. And I think a better representation for this is if we scroll down, we could even play with some color grading options. Maybe go to global saturation and turn the saturation down from one all the way to zero. Make it black and white feels pretty vintage now. And if we come out, we can see that there is such a harsh transition outside the post process volume. As soon as we go inside it, our post processing takes effect. Now, if you want your post process volume to affect your entire world, so it doesn't matter whether or not you're inside or outside of it, then come all the way down here and make sure that infinite extent unbound is turned on. So we will be using post process volumes a lot throughout the duration of this tutorial. Post process volumes are absolutely great for handling a lot of the settings of your camera. So let's come up here and I'm going to uncheck saturation because we don't need this. And another thing the post process volume handles is our render settings. So if you come in here, hopefully you can see it through the YouTube compression, but there is a lot of noise on this wall. Well, we could go into post process volume and under lumen global illumination, increase this from one to four. And that noise is completely gone. We will go over what some of these settings are within the lighting chapter. But for now, let's go over materials. So let's press control and space and create a new map. But first let's create a folder where we're gonna store all of our custom assets by right clicking on content, new folder. And I'm gonna call this one, my stuff. And within here, I'm gonna right click, create another folder and call this one maps. We can see under content, we have a folder called my stuff and in my stuff is a folder called maps. Now under maps, we could create a level by right clicking and selecting level, but that will give us a blank level. If we want a level from one of Unreal's templates, we need to come up to file, new level, and we can select a template. I wanna select time of day. Let's save this map. And we just created our first level from scratch, but it's not saved anywhere right now because we just created it. We need to press control and S, select a location to save it. I wanna to go to my stuff, maps, and just call this one material map and press save. We don't need this player star right here since we aren't making a game. This is just a demonstration of materials and static meshes. And we don't need this text right here. So select those, delete it. And auto exposure can be a little bit annoying. So we're going to turn that off with a post process volume, just like beforehand. Drag out a post process volume, scroll down, make sure infinite extent unbound is turned on. Now, so we don't have to be inside the post process volume for it to take effect. And up here, let's go to manual exposure for exposure compensation 10. Let's leave it at a value of 13. Now it is finally time to go over materials. So adding a material to a 3D object is pretty easy. Luckily for us, our starter content comes with some materials. So in our starter content, let's click on materials. And we can see we have a bunch of materials to select from. Let's say if I want to add this grass right here to the ground, then all I have to do is left mouse button, hold, drag it and let go. Now we have some nice grass and let's move this object into the middle. And maybe I want this object to be, let's try brick clay, left mouse button, hold and drag it onto it just like that. And we could even see that we do have some material slots in the details panel. So let's make this a little bit bigger, scroll down a bit. We do not have to drag this onto the 3D object. We can also drag it onto these slots. And when we are holding a material, we can see that those slots turn green to indicate that I can simply hover over and let go to drop a material on that way. Notice how this object selected has two material slots, one for the outside and one for the inside. And this mesh right here only has one material slot. So multiple materials can be on one static mesh if they are set up that way. So let's press control and Z. And I think I'm going to decrease the brightness of my post process volume. So let's go 12.5. Actually, let's go 12.7. All right, that looks good. And finally, we're going to come to content drawer. Let's create a new folder under my stuff since my stuff is where all our custom assets are going to go. Call this folder materials. And finally, let's create our first custom asset. To create an asset, all you have to do is right click 
anywhere within our content browser, make sure you're in the correct folder and simply come up here and select material. This will create a new material. It's going to ask us to name it. Let's call this one first material and save. So we can drag this onto an object right here and notice that's just using Unreal's default material, but we can edit it by simply double clicking on material and that will bring up the material editor. So right now our window is on top of our graph. Something we can do is left mouse button hold on this tab and we can dock the tab up here. That's how we can switch in between our main map view and then our editor view. You can also left mouse button hold to undock it. And if you have multiple screens, sometimes I like to just move my window off to the side on another screen. But for our purposes, I'm just going to leave it docked and we're going to switch in between them. Essentially, the entire point of the material editor is to create a bunch of nodes that will feed into this output. You might be wondering right now why Unreal Shader looks kind of similar to Blender's Principal Shader. And that's because Blender's Principal Shader is partially based off of Unreal's materials. And if we compare both shaders side by side, we can see a lot of the inputs are the same, like base color, metallic, specular, roughness, and normal. But there are a lot of inputs that don't match up exactly. But that's fine because if you ever made a lot of materials in Blender, then you would know that for 90% of materials, we are only going to use our base color, metallic, roughness, and normal inputs. And this is the exact same case in Unreal. Here we are back within our material graph and the controls for our material graph are pretty simple. You hold down the right mouse button to pan and you use the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. So right mouse button, scroll wheel, pretty similar to orthographic view modes within our viewports. So how do we get a node? Well, you can drag a node from the palette over here. So just click on palette and we get access to all the different nodes we can use. But generally I don't grab my nodes from the palette. Instead, I right click on an empty spot on my graph and here I could just type in a node. So one node we're gonna be using often is the constant node. A constant node is pretty self-explanatory. It's just a number value. So if we're gonna plug it up to roughness and we have a value of zero, then we can see that we're completely shiny. And if we bring it up to one, then we are completely rough. So let's do a middle ground of 0 0.5 for now. And another node we're gonna be using often is the color node. But notice if we right click, type in color, and we do get some options, but none of them are the traditional RGB color. Instead, we also need to type in constant and click on three vector. So constant three vector will be three different constant values. And these three different values represent R, G, and B. So we could plug it up to base color like this. And to change the color, you wanna click on the color in the details panel, or you can double click on the actual node. So let's find a value and notice that when I do move this around, our color isn't actually changing. That's because we need to bring our value up from zero up to one. So we could do it right here with the value slider, or we could even use this slider right here. So let's try to pick a value, maybe bluish. And this is very important. You can't just exit out. You need to make sure to press okay to save that color change. Our material is looking nice to see it, press apply and jump back into the level. Congratulations. You just created your first material in Unreal Engine, but what if we don't like this material and we do want to make a change? Well, let's come to first material and let's bring down this roughness to maybe 0 0.2, make it a little bit shinier. And for this base color, I'm going to double click on the node to change it. Let's make this an even deeper blue. Make sure you press OK for that color change to be saved. And now if I jump back to the level, we will see that actually there was no change. That's because in order for a change to take effect, you need to make sure you're in your material graph and press apply. So notice when I press apply and jump back, now we do see that material. And that's pretty unfortunate because our materials are not real time. And that kind of defeats the purpose of using Unreal Engine since we're using it to get some high quality visuals at 60 frames per second but we can make this real time. So in order to make a property real time where we can change it without having to press apply, we need to come into first material, right click on the property you wanna make real time, and then click on convert to parameter. Now it's gonna ask us to name this parameter, let's call it color, and let's also right click right here, convert to parameter, and I'm gonna call this one 
roughness. So let's press enter and press apply. Essentially apply compiles our materials and makes it ready for our level. So nothing really right now happened, but when we do make a change, so let's try and make this a little bit pink. We're not gonna press apply. If we jump into materials, we can see that that change did take effect. But what if we want multiple variations of this specific material? So maybe we want a blue version or a version that's more rough. Well, we could do that with material instances. So if I press control and space, I can right click on any material and simply create material instance at the very top right here. So let's call this one, actually let's just leave it as is. So this one is first material underscore instance. And now notice when I double click on it, we have access to those parameters we just created. So when we right clicked on a node and turn into a parameter, this allows us to be able to edit it within a material instance. So let's go back into first material. Let's make the color right here, just white. So R, G, and B should be one, one, one. And maybe bring down the value. That's how it's not pure white. So 0 0.7 for the value and press okay. So let's apply, save. And now we can see we have a basic white material. This is our parent material. And let's hold down alt and drag the material instance onto this object. So control space, drag that material instance there. Right now we haven't made any changes, but within the material instance window, which was right here, we can see that I'm able to grab that color and notice how when I do change it, it changes in real time. So this is very helpful in that we can see exactly what we're doing. We don't have to wait for anything to compile and press OK. So let's go roughness, make this even shinier with zero or bring it up to one. Now it's pretty rough. It almost looks like cloth. So let's expose another parameter and that is metallic. So go to first material. Now I could right click and type in constant and press enter to bring in a new constant value or I can hold down the one key and left click. So one left click, we'll bring in a constant one and holding down three and left clicking, we'll bring in a constant three vector, which is our color. So let's select these two, delete them. And right here, let's hook it up to metallic. And of course, if I press apply, jump back into our level, we can see that our material instance didn't change. We don't have access to that metallic value because we have to make it a parameter. So come to first material, right click, convert to parameter, and let's call this one metallic, press apply. And now jumping back into materials, we have our metallic right here. So we could bring this from zero to one. We really didn't notice a change, so maybe roughness should be 0 0.2. And now we do notice that change. This looks very nice. It almost looks like a car. And as we bring down the metallic, we can see it going from zero all the way back up to one notice how i'm able to hold down my left mouse button and slide my mouse to change that value but when we go above one nothing happens and when we go below zero nothing happens that's because just like a blender metallic and roughness inputs only take a value in between zero and one and to make it easier for us that's how when we slide it it clamps from zero to one within our first material Let's select, actually, let's go organize it just a bit. That's why we don't have crossing wires. Select our metallic and slider min, leave it at zero, slider max. Maybe leave that at one. For our roughness, do the same exact thing, so leave it at zero. And for our max is one. Press apply, go back into our material. And now within our material instance, we're able to safely slide between zero and one. And it is in real time, which is absolutely amazing. Let's hold down alt, move this around and create a new material instance. So right click on our main material, create material instance. Let's drag that one right there. Open up our brand new material instance and make this maybe an orangey color. Do a bright orange, make sure to press okay. And notice how I need to make sure that the parameter is turned on. If I turn this off, then I'm telling Unreal that I don't want to override that parameter. So make sure it's turned on same thing with metallic and roughness and let's leave this at zero but maybe bring up the roughness just a bit at 0 0.6 so let's get out we made a lot of changes to our projects and created some custom assets so press control and space make sure you save everything so save all 
before we move on to creating more advanced materials and recreating our materials from Blender, let's rename these assets. So press control space and to rename, you need to right click and simply click on rename or the shortcut is F2, just like on Windows. So we're gonna rename this one to M underscore basic material. And let's call this one right here. So press F2 to rename MI for material instance underscore basic underscore purple. And maybe right here, call this one MI underscore basic underscore orange. There's no specific reasons why I start off my materials with M underscore or my material instances with MI underscore other than it is just convention. It's what the Unreal Engine community uses. And generally when you open up a project, it's gonna follow some naming conventions. But this is your program, so feel free to use whatever you want. Next up in this video, we're gonna go over how we can import Blender assets into Unreal Engine. But before we can do that, you need to download some special assets I created for this course. Link in the description below. You can download it completely for free. Also included within those assets are some tools we're gonna to use at the very end of this video when we create the monkey shrine environment. So once you have those downloaded, you want to unzip the folder and grab all the folders in there and drag them onto our desktop for easy access. And when they've been unzipped, we're specifically going to be going over the folder that says Blender to Unreal Assets for now. So double click on this and we can see that we have a Blender project and some textures that that Blender project is linking to. So let's open up the Blender project and we can see that it is pretty simple. All there is is a chair in the middle and a little plane right at the bottom. Essentially what we're going to be doing is that we're going to go through the process of bringing over this material and bringing over this object for use in Unreal Engine. So this is going to be pretty fun. Now let's go over the process of recreating this Spanish pavement material in Unreal. Now if you increase the size of this, we can see exactly what our Spanish pavement material is. This is just a really simple standard blender material that's being fed into the principal BSDF. We have our base color, our roughness, and our normal, which is pretty much what you need for 90% of materials. And we also have the functionality to control the scale right here to make that texture bigger or smaller. So to begin, let's go back into Unreal Engine. And luckily for us, we have the textures ready to go since our blender file is linking to them. It is right here. Spanish payment underscore normal roughness and base color. So to import a texture, we first need to make sure that our content browser is docked in layouts because if it's not, it's kind of hard to drag it in and let's create a new folder. Call this one textures and simply highlight the textures we want to import and drag it in just like this and let go. So now we can see automatically they're in our file. Make sure to save everything. That's how if our Unreal Engine crashes, we don't lose those textures. And notice at the bottom right here, it says Spanish payment has been imported as a normal map. That's because Unreal is smart enough to say, hey, look at this texture right here. And you could double click on it to open up the texture editor. This kind of looks like a normal map. So we're going to set it up as a normal map. So right here, it already set our compression settings to normal map and the texture group to world normal map. Now the texture group does not have to be world normal map but you want to make sure compression settings is set to normal map and sRGB is unchecked because this isn't a color texture. So let's double check and make sure our base color is okay. And it looks like right here, sRGB is turned on. That is exactly what we want because this is a color texture. And if we go into our Spanish payment roughness, we can see sRGB is turned on. That's exactly what we don't want to happen. We need to uncheck it. So unchecking it, it's just telling you Unreal, hey, this texture should be used as a mask which is very similar to if we jump back into Blender, notice how for my Spanish payment roughness, we select non-color and for our normal map, we also select non-color for color space. Essentially non-color is the exact same thing of unchecking sRGB in Unreal Engine. So let's come back here and in materials, right click. Let's create a new material calls one M underscore Spanish pavements and double click to go into Spanish payment. While I'm at it, let's exit out of all these assets by just pressing the middle mouse button and press control and space to bring back that content browser. So we can just select these three textures by holding down shift and selecting Spanish payments, left mouse button, drag and let go. 
Now we have these three textures ready to go. We can see our color is set to color and our Spanish payment is set to linear color, which is exactly what we want. And our normal is of course set to normal. As you can guess, just like in Blender, we're gonna hook up the color to color and our roughness to roughness and our normal to normal. All right, this texture is starting to look pretty nice. Let's press apply, drag it onto the floor. As you can guess by just looking at it, our Spanish payment is tiling way too much. So let's jump back into our material and let's recreate the functionality of the mapping node from Blender. So essentially the mapping node allows us to just scale our tiling. We need that in Unreal. So jumping into Unreal, unfortunately there is no direct mapping node in Unreal. We're gonna have to recreate that functionality. So firstly, we need to right click and bring in a texture coordinate node. Press enter, read it in right here. So this essentially is our UV map. Now in order to tile, we need to scale whatever's coming out of this. So we could right click, type in multiply to bring in a multiply node, or as a shortcut, I could hold down the M key for multiply and a left click to bring it in like that. Because I'm real smart enough to know that you're probably gonna wanna multiply a lot of different things when you're making your shaders. So let's hook it up right there. And I'm gonna hold down one and left click to bring in a constant vector. Let's hook it up right there. And we're gonna make this a parameter that's how we're able to edit it in real time. So convert to parameter and call this one tile. Now, default value will probably have to be one because if it's zero, then there won't be any tiling. It'll just be a solid color, which defeats the purpose of textures. And we're gonna hook it up just like this into its UVs. And let's press apply, save. And we're gonna create a material instance. That's how we get access to that slider. So right click, create material instance, and let's drag the Spanish pavement material instance. Remember naming conventions, instead of having this underscore inst, let's make this mi underscore Spanish pavement, mi for material instance. To double check that we do have the correct material on the floor, click on the floor, and it looks like we do have mi underscore Spanish pavement. Double click on this material instance, we're gonna undock it, make this a little bit bigger. That's how we can actually see our edits. Press tile. And now I'm able to change the scale of this. So let's bring this down maybe to, let's go 0 0.5. And now our scaling is looking a lot better, but we do have a major issue and maybe you're able to see it. And that is, let's go real quickly, add in a temporary point light, bring it right there. And now if we look at the direction of our point light, our normals or shadows are completely inverted. It looks like the concrete is coming out of the brick when the concrete should be coming into the brick. And that's because Blender normal maps are different from Unreal Engine. Normal maps in Blender are OpenGL, while normal maps in Unreal Engine are DirectX. So we need to convert our Blender normal maps into DirectX normal maps. And that could be a hassle. We're going to have to open up Substance Designer or some other program and then invert the y-axis. But Unreal is smart enough to realize that that will be an issue that comes up. So instead, we could just open up the normal map. And down here within the advanced section, so clicking on this arrow in texture, we can select Flip Green Channel. Flip Green Channel will convert an OpenGL map into a DirectX map. Let's save. And now if we jump into our level, our payment is now coming out of the floor which is exactly what we're looking for. And we can delete our light now. The takeaway is that Blender uses OpenGL normal maps and Unreal uses DirectX. If you import an OpenGL normal map into Unreal, then make sure you flip the green channel. We've added some of the features of the mapping node, but unfortunately for us, the mapping node has even more features where we're able to tile it on a specific axis. So maybe make it stretch larger in the Y axis and we're even able to change its location and move around to get the texture in the spot where we exactly want it. So we're gonna have to recreate that again in Unreal. Jumping back into our Spanish payment, let's first work on the different tilings. So instead of just plugging in a parameter into multiply, we're gonna duplicate this. So press Control and W to duplicate a node. And let's call this one up here, tile X, and down here, Call this one tile Y. Now we're gonna append these. So drag from it 
and simply type append vector. Hook up tau y and plug it up to multiply just like that. So now we've divided that one parameter into two different parameters and using an append will essentially create a two vector and this two vector will be multiplied and affect each u and v axis separate from each other. Pressing apply, jumping into material map and here we have tile x. Click on the arrow to reset. Now we can see that it will stretch in the x-axis or stretch it in the y-axis. Now let's go over how we can offset this texture. So let's jump into Spanish payment. And instead of a multiply, we're going to be using an addition. So right click, type in add, press enter, and let's hook it up right here. We're going to create another parameter. Now I could create that parameter by holding that one and left clicking, right click, convert to parameter. Or I can hold down the S key for scalar, S and left click. So S and left clicking will automatically create a scalar parameter for us. And we're gonna call this one offset X. Press control and W to duplicate that. Call this one offset Y. Do the same thing by dragging out here using an append node to create a two vector. Hook it up like this and plug it up just like that. So pressing apply, we now have the ability to move our texture around. So maybe I can move it along the X or we can move it along the Y. So we've essentially recreated the Blender mapping node in Unreal by doing just a little bit of vector math. And finally, to complete this material, let's add in the normal map strength. So in Blender, all you have to do is increase this normal map to increase that strength or bring it down to decrease it all the way to zero where there is no strength. And in Unreal, we could do something similar by right clicking and typing in flatten normal. So press enter and we can hook it up like this. So normal goes into normal input, result goes into normal and flatness. It's just gonna ask for a scalar parameter. So hold down S, left click, call this one normal flatness. And we're going to leave it at zero, plug it up like this, press apply. And now within our level, with our material instance, check normal flatness. And notice that, let's go uh, kind of like an angle. When I increase that, it gets lower and lower and lower, all the way to one, where it basically turns off. But if we move this into the negative, so negative two, negative three, negative one, and so on, we can drastically increase that normal map strength. So pressing zero. At this point, we basically remade a very simple Blender material in Unreal Engine. So we have all this nice functionality where we're able to increase its normals, move that texture around, or tile that texture in different UV axes. If we want some more artistic control, then we can add the ability to tint the albedo color. So let's jump in Spanish Payment. And right here, I'm going to hold down M and left click to add in a multiply. And hold down 3 and left click to add in a color. Let's right click, convert to parameter. Call this one color tint. And for the value, we're going to increase this all the way to 1. That's so by default, it's not tinting anything. And plug this into base color. Press apply and there is no change because it's white. But as soon as we edit that tint, maybe make it just a little bit more reddish. We're able to very slightly change our color and give our texture a different feel. So that's one thing I like to do with a lot of my materials is just add in this small color tint to give me some more control. Another thing we could do is right click on my textures and go to convert to parameter. So now I'm going to call this one color texture. And notice now, after I press apply, within our material instance, we get access to that texture and we could swap out this texture with something else. So let's do the same thing right here. Right click, convert to parameter, call this one roughness. And right click, convert to parameter, call this one normal texture. And actually, we're going to call this one up here roughness texture. Press apply. And essentially what we just created is a master material. So not only does it have to be Spanish payment, 
But if we have another albedo, normal, and roughness texture, we just swap them in and we get access to all these controls and the tint functionality without having to recreate a new material, saving us a lot of time. Also, most of the time, some materials might have a metallic. So to make this a complete master material, let's press Control and W to duplicate this. And instead of a roughness texture, let's call this one metallic. Hook this up to UVs. And sometimes we use a metallic texture. Sometimes we don't use a metallic texture like right now on the Spanish pavement. And there is no metallic. I'm going to give us the ability to turn on and off a metallic channel by right clicking. Let's go type in static switch parameter. Select it right there. Is metallic question mark. And by default, it's going to be false. So if it is not metallic, then of course, we're going to use Unreal's default metallic. Same thing with Blender's default metallic. And that is a one a left click, a value of zero for no metallic. But if it is, then we are going to be using that metallic texture. So plug it up to true and hook it up to metallic like that. We didn't notice any change because metallic isn't activated. But within my material parameter, if I turn this on and set it to true, we can see that now we have a, a new texture that would take a metallic map if we are going to be using any. Now our material no longer really functions the same purpose as Spanish pavement. So I'm going to rename that material. Let's jump back into materials right here. Right click, rename, and call this one M underscore master material. A master material is essentially the base from which a lot of materials will be created. We will go over what that means in an example in just a bit. But for now, let's fix our material instance. Obviously, you need to turn off metallic since this is payment. Uncheck it. And we can set everything back to its default value. So offset X, offset Y. Default values are zero by clicking on the arrows. And for our tiling, it was one. But that's a little bit too much tiling so maybe only tile 0 0.2 and 0 0.2 that looks pretty neat we can leave it as is let's save and exit don't forget to save everything because we have made a lot of changes so far by just selecting save all and save selected now we're going to go over the fun stuff and that is how to export your 3d objects in blender and bring them into unreal engine so this is a pretty big deal and it is important to know that 3d models in unreal engine that aren't deforming are called static meshes. So whenever I say static mesh, just know I mean a 3D model. So whenever you import an FBX or an OBJ into Unreal Engine, it's gonna be imported as a static mesh. So before we begin, you wanna open up the Blender project that's included in the downloadable files. Before exporting out a Blender object, there are a couple things we need to handle. So number one, make sure your object is in the middle of your world. So you want your object to be somewhat near the world origin point because it is the world origin point from which the pivot of our static mesh in Unreal will be. Another thing we want to do is make sure that the scale is correct. So let's go into orthographic view mode, press shift A and add in a cube. So Unreal's cube by default is two meters by two meters. So let's move this cube up and we can see that this chair is about a meter tall. That seems okay, so let's delete it. And another thing we're going to do is make sure that our normals are facing the correct direction. So you can see where your normals are facing by coming up here and clicking on face orientation. You want to make sure that everything is blue. If something is not blue, then select everything and press shift N to see if it's going to fix it. If it doesn't fix it, then you want to select the affected faces and then type in flip to flip those normals. So right now we can see that these normals are not facing outward, they're facing inwards. And that means that these faces will not render in Unreal Engine 5. So that's no good. Select everything, press Shift N, recalculate, and that did fix it. Another thing we need to do is press Control and A to apply rotation and scale, because otherwise our transformations can be a little bit messed up when we do export it. Let's get out of face orientation. Real quickly, let's go over this material graph. It's pretty simple. We have an albedo color, metallic, roughness, and normal, but we also have a color mask. And this color mask is pretty fun because it allows us to change the color of our chair's plastic. And we will create that functionality within Unreal Engine. So with all of that being said, 
I think it's time to export out this object. So to export out object, you want to make sure that you have that object selected, come up to file, export, and we can either select FBX or OBJ. I find FBX to give the best results. So select FBX and make sure selected objects is turned on. If selected objects isn't turned on, then it's going to export out our entire scene. And generally we do not want that. You want to select a nice location for it to be saved and in geometry, make sure smoothing is set to face. Give your mesh a name. It's already named chair. We can leave it like that and click on export. Now we can see that we have an FBX file. If we double click on it, this file looks correct. So let's bring this into Unreal Engine. But first we need to create a new folder. So let's right click on my stuff, new folder, call this folder meshes. And let's drag in chair FBX. So generally I find the default values of FBX import options to be good. So let's select reset to default, except down here for create new material. I'm going to do do not create material and we're not going to import textures. I find relying on Unreal to import textures and materials to never really work. I'd prefer to just create the materials completely from scratch because they do give a better result. And finally click on import. So now if I drag this out, we can see that my scene is a lot bigger than expected. Let's double check to make sure that our scale is correct by going into orthographic view mode. So let's go left, press alt and two at the same time to turn on wireframe, hold the middle mouse button down and let's measure it. So we can see that it's 90 centimeters or 0 0.9 meters. So that's almost one meter tall. That does line up with blender. So let's jump back into perspective and let's delete these right there and maybe scale down the entire scene. So just bring this a little bit down. Make that thinner. Let's go move this into the middle. That's how it is the main focus. Also, if you ever want a human reference, what you can do is come to add, add a feature or content pack, select third person, and then click on add to project. This is going to add a bunch of new assets. So we could come into mannequin character mesh and drag out SK underscore mannequin. And we can see that hmm, maybe this chair is a little bit smaller than expected. So we can increase this just a little bit. Actually, right there did seem fine. It seems that my static mesh is at a good scale right now. Everything was correct when we imported from Blender. Looks like there are no issues. So let's create the chair material. So let's go into my stuff, materials, and I'm going to right click. Actually, before we create a new material, let's demonstrate what our master material can do. So right click on the master material, create material instance, and let's call this one mi underscore chair. Let's save that, open it up, but we do need some textures in. So let's go to textures, drag out our downloaded assets. Let's select chair base color, mask, metallic. And we see we also have another one called chair metallic roughness occlusion. We're going to ignore that for now, but we will go over what that is in just a bit. Chair normal and roughness. So drag this all right here and let go. So we can see that Unreal decided to import chair underscore base color as a normal map. Double click on this. That is absolutely wrong. So we need to reset this to default. So let's click on the arrow, set the world for compression settings. This is not a normal map. This is a default because if it's a normal map, then it's just going to ruin all the colors. And this is after all a color texture. So make sure sRGB is turned on. Let's double check that all the other textures are correct. So chair underscore color mask. This is a mask, so we need to make sure sRGB is unchecked. It's unchecked. Same thing for metallic. Uncheck sRGB. Looks like it was checked. For normal, uncheck sRGB. Compression settings set to normal. And texture group, world normal map. That's optional, but we can leave it as is. So our normal is looking fine. Let's go and chair roughness. Uncheck sRGB because it's not a color and everything seems to be good. Let's save everything. So save all, save selected, hover my mouse right here and use the middle mouse button to start exiting out of all these textures because we do not need them. So now within our MI underscore chair, 
which is down here. We can see what the parent is. And the parent is M underscore master material that we did great in the last section. In MI underscore chair, check on all these textures. And within content drawer, let's decrease that size and drag color base right there. Let's go drag our metallic. Actually, we need to activate metallic. That's how we're using our metallic map right there, our normal right there, and our roughness should go right there like that. And for our normal map, we need to make sure that it's flipped because after all, if this is from Blender, then it's OpenGL. So down here, flip green channel to make it DirectX and compatible with Unreal Engine. For the static mesh, you don't want to offset or tile your UVs. Keep your offsets at zero and your tiles at one. Let's save, come out here, go into our materials and drag MI underscore chair. Our chair material is looking great. We were able to create it without ever even touching the material editor graph. Instead, we let the master material handle everything and simply create a chair material instance. But as we can see, if we open up our chair instance and undock it, we are limited to whatever was in the master material. We don't have access to, let's say, in right here in Blender, to changing the color of our plastic. So if we wanna change the color of our plastic, we're gonna to have to create a new material. We just use the material instance right there to demonstrate what master materials are. So let's create a new material, call this one M underscore chair. And let's delete MI underscore chair. It's going to give me a warning saying that this level is referencing it, which it is, but we could just force delete it anyways. So let's double click on M underscore chair and dock it up there like that. So let's press control and space and drag in chair base color. Let's also drag in our normal, our roughness, and our metallic and chair color mask. So we're going to hook it up first like normal, and then we're going to use this chair mask right here to add in a color changing feature. So metallic goes there, roughness, normal, and hook up our color to base color, press apply, and let's drag M underscore chair. We're pretty much getting the same result as our master material. Now's the time to handle this mask. And we're going to introduce a lerp node right click type in linear interpolate or a shortcut is to hold down the l key and left click so lerp is very similar to our mix node so if you open up blender again we can see that we're using a mix and we're using this color mask right here as the alpha of the mask and we are then going to override whatever base color is right here with the color that we're choosing right there so that is essentially what we're going to be doing. We're going to factor this in the alpha for our mask. And then for our base color, I'm going to drag this into A, drag this into base color, and then hold down three, left click to add in a new color, right click, convert to parameter, call this one plastic color. And for its default value, let's give this something a little bit bluish and plug that into B. So this is very similar to the mix node in Blender. Essentially, we're telling Unreal that wherever there is white for our chair color mask, we want to override our actual base color with the plastic color. So press apply, save, and we're going to create a material instance, drag the material instance onto our chair. Let's open it up. And now if we select that color and the color picker, we can see that we are changing our colors just like in Blender, which is amazing and pretty fun. We can even add some more customization. So down here, maybe if I think the chair is a little bit too rough or too shiny, then we can drag from RGB, put this into a multiply node, hold down S and left click for a scalar parameter. Call this one roughness amount. And the default value will be one, which won't make any change. But now we can see, we jump back into our material, that for our material parameters, we have roughness amount. I could increase this to add in more roughness until something ridiculous like 
let's go 100 where it's completely rough there is no shine or bring it back to one which is its default maybe i want this to be extra shiny so decrease that value right there and this is why i love material instances is that i can select this material instance press ctrl and w to duplicate it let's add in another chair drag on the new material instance open that up undock it and make this a completely different color let's go a little bit pinkish bring its roughness back to its default of one hold on alt duplicate another chair press ctrl w and let's make this one first we gotta apply it there kind of uh, orangey just like that so with material instances it allows us to have a lot of nice customization press save and we're going to save everything but we have one issue with this and that is if we jump into our meshes and drag out our chair we can see that our chair doesn't have any of those materials so we can apply a material to the mesh as a whole by double clicking on a static mesh editor and we can see that we have a default material let's set the default material as our m underscore chair press save come out here and now we can see that I could just drag in a chair anywhere and it will have the material of M underscore chair real quickly. Let's rename this chair to SM underscore chair. SM stands for static mesh and it's naming convention. You can name it whatever you want. It is your project. But before we move on to lighting, which is really exciting, we first have to go over this wacky texture right here. So let's go into textures. And let's drag in chair underscore metallic roughness and occlusion. Drop it in like this. Double click on it. And this is not an sRGB. This is a mask. So I'm going to uncheck sRGB. Now this does look kind of funky. But notice how as soon as I uncheck my green channel, my blue channel. We see that wait. The red channel is its own mask. This is a metallic mask. Uncheck red. Check green. Green channel is also its own mask. This is roughness. And blue is a ambient occlusion mask, which we aren't going to be using, but the option is there. The reason why I included this texture is because oftentimes Unreal users, they won't import their textures separately. So they won't have their metallic texture separate from the roughness texture. Instead, to save space and make things a lot easier to organize, they're going to combine a lot of their textures into one map and have them be separated by the red, green, and blue channels. So to use a texture like this, Let's jump back into M underscore chair and drag it in. Make sure it's at the linear color. And now for red, we can drag this into metallic. And then for roughness, we could drag that. Or actually, we're going to drag it down here into the multiply node. So we're replacing two textures with one texture. Really good at saving space and organizing. So this is something you're going to see a lot in Unreal Engine is that instead of dragging from RGB, there's gonna be several different masks in one texture and they'll drag from either R, G, or B individually. So let's just organize everything a bit. And I wanna go over one more thing. And that is if you press the C key, then that's going to add in a comment. So maybe I could say handles color and then drag this comment over these nodes right here. We can make it bigger in the bottom right hand corner and now i can move all these nodes as if they're one and even change the color of this comments so make it something like red so comments are pretty good if you have a very intense complicated node graph then come through and start to comment all your nodes just to help with organization for yourself and others and with all that being said that is the gist of taking your blender objects and materials and bringing them into unreal engine don't forget we did make a lot of changes and have a lot of new assets save everything now it's finally time to go over one of my favorite features of unreal engine 5 and that is ue5's brand new lighting system called lumen so you probably already heard a lot about lumen but at its very basics it provides us with real-time bounce lighting at frame rates you would see in games. So bounce lighting at 60 frames per second, even 120 frames per second. And the bounce lighting does look really good. And if you've ever rendered bounce lighting out in Blender with cycles, 
then you would know why Lumen is a pretty big deal. So before we jump into UE5 and learn about Lumen, let's go into Blender and see how it handles bounce lighting. Of course, within Blender, the way you get bounce lighting is by setting your render engine to cycles and simply rendering. The entire point of cycles, V-Ray, RenderMan, and other programs are to calculate really accurate bounce lighting. Like right here on the sphere, the right side is a little bit red because of this red wall. While this is realistic and looks great, unfortunately for us, if I move my camera around, obviously this isn't even close to real time. And if you've ever rendered out a Blender animation, then you would know how long it takes to render a scene. And what if you want to make some changes after your render, then you're going to have to render the entire animation over again. And this is why real time is so powerful, is because it allows us to quickly speed up our workflow. And while I am aware that Blender does have semi real time bounce lighting with light irradiance volumes, unfortunately for us, the quality isn't really there. And if we do move an object around, we still have to bake that lighting by clicking on bake and direct lights, which doesn't really make it real time. Now it's time to see how Unreal Engine 5 handles lighting. So included within the downloadable assets is this UE5 lighting project. Simply double click on it and open up the .u project. Once you have your project open, press control and space. You want to go into lighting example maps and double click on light bounce. So here we can see the same map that was from Blender within Unreal Engine. And if we select this light right here and move it around, we can see that we are affecting that bounce light. This is real time right now. And we can even see the frame rate by coming up here and clicking on show FPS. The shortcut is control shift and H and I'm going to press G right now to hide everything. We can see that when I move my light around, we get real time bounce lighting at 120 frames per second. So that is absolutely amazing. This is brand new in Unreal Engine 5. If you want to see what Unreal Engine looked like back in Unreal Engine 4 without any bounce lighting, then we're going to select the post process volume. And you want to come all the way down under rendering, global illumination, and make sure method is checked. Change it from lumen, because we are using lumen right now, to none. So this is what Unreal Engine 4 used to give us. And this is what Unreal Engine 5 gives us using lumen. Obviously, bounce lighting makes all the difference in the world. And thanks to lumen, we get that bounce lighting in real time. So enough fanboying over lumen. Let's go over what some of the different type of lighting options Unreal Engine 5 has to offer. So first off, let's delete this light. I'm pressing Control Shift and H to get rid of those frames. And let's go to Create, Lights, and a point light. So point light is pretty self-explanatory. A point light is just a light that emits in all different directions. So a lot of the different properties of our lights will be the same throughout. We have our intensity to increase that intensity or decrease it. Light color to change that color. And we even have a source radius. So what if we want some soft shadows? You want to slowly increase that. And we can see that our shadows get, and let's decrease the intensity. Our shadows get softer and softer as our point light gets bigger, very similar to Blender. And if we decrease that radius, then it gets sharper and sharper. It's important to know that if you aren't getting soft lighting, then you need to come into settings, project settings, and all the way down here under rendering, make sure that virtual shadow maps is turned on. If we're using shadow maps, then we will not get soft shadows. So make sure virtual shadow maps are selected. Next up is temperature. Temperature is very similar to Blender's temperature node in that we can increase that temperature to make it more blue or decrease it to make it more orangey, just like light bulbs. So that's pretty neat that we have that feature. And then we have effects world. Pretty obvious, turns on and off, and cast shadows. Maybe we don't want shadows, then turn that off. But what's very unique is that even though we do turn it off, we still get bounce lighting, which makes us look, especially this sphere right here, which makes it look pretty weird. So turn cast shadow on, and we also have indirect lighting intensity. Maybe you want that bounce light to be more prevalent, then you want to increase that from one. And we see that the more I increase it, then the more bounce lighting we get. I would suggest to just leave it at one, maybe go in between one and five, because if you do this to, let's say something really large, like a hundred, then a lot of artifacts will be more apparent. So just leave it at one or five. It's important to know that most of these options will be shared with other lighting types. And up here for mobility, if we know that our world's going to be completely dynamic, as in our lights are going to move around, 
or we're not baking any lights, then you want to make sure that they're set to movable. Just to tell Unreal that, hey, this light is completely dynamic. If it moves around, that's expected. But if we are going to bake lights, then you either want to set to static or stationary. We will be going over those in just a bit. But for now, just set to movable. So let's delete that lights. And next up on the lights is the spotlight. So spotlight is as expected. It's just a spotlight. So we have the same options as an intensity, light color, source radius, temperature, effects world. But this is pretty unique in that we have inner and outer cone angle. So we can increase that cone angle with the outer cone angle. Or we can increase and decrease the fall off of that point light. So let's move it maybe a little bit right there and decrease the outer cone angle. And then if we increase that inner cone angle, we can see that our light has a sharper and sharper fall off. Or I could bring this all the way down to zero for a really smooth fall off. So let's delete that. Next up is rectangle light. Rectangle light is, as you can guess, just like an area light. So we can move it like this and we can increase the size of it. If we do just scale it normally, nothing really happens. It does scale the attenuation radius, which controls what objects should be lit by the light. So if we decrease the attenuation radius, then we can see that our light is no longer working, but if we increase it, then it does. So I generally don't really play with it. I just leave it as is. But if we do want to increase the rectangle light, then that's where the source width and source height properties come in handy. We can even edit that barn door angle. So maybe we want to decrease that. We can see that we do change the fall off of a rectangle light and we can even control the length right there. So maybe if you don't want any barn doors, just set this to zero. Before we move on to the next light, a unique property of the rectangle light is the ability to add a source texture if you do want a little bit of variation. So let's delete our rectangle lights, come up to create lights, and we didn't go over the directional light. As you can guess, if we zoom out, a directional light is basically just a sunlight. It is a light that's shooting rays infinitely in a specific direction, and we can control that direction by just rotating our light, just like in Blender. Before we go over some of the unique properties of our directional light, I'm just going to deactivate it right now by unchecking effects world. That's how we can go over the skylights. So go to lights, skylight, and simply drag it in. And nothing is happening right now. This is because you can think of the skylight as basically an HDRI. What the skylight is trying to do is that it's going to take a 360 degree panorama photo of a world and then project that lighting onto our world. But as we can guess, there is nothing to take a photo of since our world is a black void. So we need to create a sky. And with this skylight, you will see how the skylight captures that sky color and project it into our little room. So to create a sky, firstly, we need to activate the sun. And then we need to drag in something new under visual effects, sky and atmosphere. Dragging in sky and atmosphere won't do anything right now. And that's because I need to come into our sun. This is a unique property of our directional light. Scroll all the way down until we get to atmosphere and cloud and make sure atmosphere sunlight is turned on. Basically, we're telling Unreal that, hey, this directional light right here, I want you to use it as a sun. And now our sky and atmosphere is working. If I press H on the sky and atmosphere, it's going to hide it. If I press Control H, then it's going to unhide it. That's just a shortcut for this eye right here. Now we can see that we do have a nice sky. And if I click on my skylight, we need to set it to movable and make sure real-time capture is enabled. So now if I move my sun, that's how it's not casting light into our room. We can see that our skylight is affecting our world. Essentially, it is taking a 360 degree panoramic view and it's projecting that view as colors. We can see right here, I can move it. We get some nice soft shadow thanks to the skylight. We can see our world before and after the skylight by pressing H to hide it and control H to unhide. So this is our world without a skylight looks pretty bad and this is a world with the skylight so it's absolutely amazing and one cool thing is that if i add in a shape you don't have to follow along at this part but i can scale up this box i'm gonna scale like this 
and we can see that the skylight is bouncing some nice indirect lighting into this little room and we can control it with a moving door and this is all brand new to unreal engine 5 thanks to lumen just because lumen has been introduced in unreal engine 5 doesn't mean we didn't have global illumination in unreal engine 4 and other game engines we did have global illumination but this was faked in that everything was calculated beforehand and put into light textures and shadow textures and then these textures were overlaid onto 3d objects so it was a way to get global illumination without any of the cost and unreal engine 5 does have that ability and there's still some circumstances where you would prefer to bake all your lighting over lumen and that's what we're going to do right now we're going to compare two scenes so we're going to light one scene using lumen and light that same scene using baked lighting and see which one comes up on top and compare the differences between the two okay so to begin you want to make sure you're still in our previous project which is ue5 lighting project press control and space and let's go under lighting example maps arc viz room so double click on it and we won't see anything right now that's because we need to press alt and two and we're able to see that we do have just a very small little room and there are no lights so of course everything is pitch black so begin let's add in a directional light just drag it in like that press alt and four and we're going to rotate it that's how we're actually able to put the light in the room and have that bounce light bounce around and just illuminate the entire room so the lighting already looks pretty good but we do have an issue that is when we look outside it is pitch black so we're going to fix this with of course our sky so visual effects sky and atmosphere let's drag it out and click on our directional light scroll all the way down we want to tell our sky and atmosphere that we need to use this light specifically as a sun so check atmosphere and sunlight okay great but we still have an issue and that is the entire half of our world is completely black so we're going to fill that up by going to create visual effects and fog so we're just going to drop some fog in there and now when i look outside that looks a lot better but when we do have the fog we have an issue and that is the fog is inside our room which doesn't really make sense you wouldn't expect fog inside a room scroll up within our exponential height fog we want to make sure start distance just drag it all the way to 5000 so this is without it and this is with it very slight difference but we don't want the fog in the room so let's drag it up like this and also another thing i'm going to do is click on the sun make it movable since our world is completely dynamic and here is a nice little shortcut if you hold down control and l so control and l we get this brand new gizmo and we're able to rotate this sun around very quickly so let's go outside and see what this looks like and pressing control and l we will see that when we do lower the sun down our sky and atmosphere is now completely black since our sun is below our world but we have the issue and that is our exponential height fog is illuminated and that's not physically accurate because there is no sun to illuminate our fog so we're going to click on our exponential height fog and within fog in scattering color we're going to make this completely black and if we scroll all the way down here for directional in scattering we're also going to make this one completely black but we have the issue and that is if we raise our skylight up we can see that uh oh and now our fog is completely black even when our sun is above our world and we do want our fog to illuminate it and this is where a special setting is coming in within project settings we need to make sure under all settings type in height fog and support sky and atmosphere affecting height fog because right now our height fog is separate from our sky and atmosphere we want the two to interact with each other so we need to make sure this is turned on and now restart our project let's save everything once our project has been restarted press control and space to jump back into our archivist room and now if we lower our light with control and l we can see that our fog is no longer emissive so if you ever want physically accurate fog that is interacting with your sky and atmosphere then make sure and let's go find where our fog is select it and make sure fog in scattering color is set to black and down here directional in scattering color is also set to black so now we have a pretty nice world what i'm going to do right now is let's add in a post process volume that's how we can actually control our exposure so come to create volumes and post process volume 
scroll down, make sure infinite extend unbound is checked. That's so we don't have to be inside the post process volume for it to take effect. Come into exposure, metering mode, set this to manual and exposure compensation of let's try 11. Hold down control and L and we're going to rotate this. That's how our light is angled like this. Now, if you want to mimic sunrise or sunset, we can even lower the light just a bit and notice how our light even changes color. So if we decrease it like this, we see now our light is a morning orange. And if you even look outside, our sky is kind of orangey. But I find a direction like this to look pretty good. So I think we're just going to leave it like that. And another thing we can add in is come to create lights and a skylight. That's because if we do hide our skylight and if we rotate our sun around, our scene is completely black, which isn't realistic at all. So press Ctrl H to bring back our skylight and make sure real time capture is enabled and set to movable. We can even control the strength of our skylight right here with an intensity scale. Instead of one, we can make this 10. And now our skylight is super powerful, but we're just going to leave it at one for now. And let's select our sun and kind of move it around just like this. Angle the sun just a little bit more. And let's start working on some furniture for our room. So press G to hide everything. Press Control and H. And let's go into meshes. And we have a couple of meshes we can use. If I drag this out and wait for the shaders to compile, we have a nice chair. And okay, we need to work on the post process. Increase that exposure. Let's go 12 points. 12.7. That seems pretty good. I want it where when I look out the window, it's kind of blinding. Press control and space. Let's drag out SM underscore table. It looks like I need to wait for some of these shaders to compile. And it did right there. So maybe move this back right up against the wall. Press control and space. Drag out a phone and this clock. Actually, let's switch the positions of these two. So the phone's going to go back here. The clock's going to go up in the front. And I want to rotate my clock directly backwards on the clock's angle. So let's jump into local space with this button. Press E and rotate it back on its own X axis. And let's jump back into world space. Position it on the table. And no table in architecture is complete without a coffee cup. And another thing I'm going to do is go into post process volume and just leave that at 13. Okay. 13 seems pretty good. And yeah, that was pretty quick decorating, but if you do want to make a different color, lucky for you, all of these meshes have the ability to change color. Thanks to the way that I set up the material. So if we click on this rotary phone, I could jump into the material instance. And within its material instance, we go color. And maybe instead of blue, I want this to be kind of reddish or maybe a weird orangey pinkish. But I'm just going to leave it at blue. Press OK. You can also change the color of the wall back here. So maybe if you don't want it to be blue and you just want this to be white, then you just come right here and decrease the value like that to give it a white wall. But I'm going to press cancel because I like that wall being just a little bit bluish. And actually, I don't like the new color of the phone. Jump back into the phone's material instance and change the color. You can always set a parameter back to its default value by clicking on this white arrow, just like that. I would say we're pretty much done at this point. Maybe some last finishing touches go into post process volume. And we're going to scroll down all the way down here under Lumen Global Illumination. And I'm going to move it. That's so we can actually read what this is for final gather quality. Instead of one, we can set to four, which will drastically increase that quality. And same thing with reflections right here. So reflections for Lumen reflections. Maybe if we zoom in, let's go with these props. Quality, one, two, four. As of now for Unreal Engine 5 Early Access, for some reason, 4 for reflection and global illumination produces the best quality.
Do not forget to save everything because we have done a lot so far. So click save all and save selected. We are ready now to create a variation of this room that instead of using lumen, we're going to use the more traditional method of getting global illumination, and that is baking our light textures. So to begin, let's go to content drawer, maps. Let's select Archivist room, press Control and W to make a duplicate, and let's call this one baked. Double click on this to go into it. Let's save selected. And let's rename our previous map to Lumen. That's how we're able to compare a baked room to a Lumen room, which is fully dynamic. Before baking, you need to make sure that your lights are stationary, because if they aren't, then they will not show up in your light textures. So we're going to select our sunlight, scroll up here, and set to stationary. Same thing for our skylight, set this is stationary. And let's go make sure that our x measure high fog is stationary. And our sky and atmosphere is also stationary. Now we need to turn off Lumen by going into Post Process Volume. Scrolling down into Rendering Settings. For Reflections, set this to None. For Lumen Global Illumination Method, set this to None. <laughs> and now our scene is looking pretty bad. This is the part where we need to bake our environment. But before we do that, we need a special window. So come to Windows and select World Settings. If your world settings isn't docked right here, then just dock it next to your details panel. So essentially world settings is just that. It's the settings of different parameters of your world, and it's where we control the quality of our light bakes. So right here under light mass, you want to click on the show advanced arrow and make sure force no pre-computer lighting is turned off. If it's turned on, then we're not going to have any bakes. So make sure that that is unchecked. Now let's see what Unreal looks like when we just bake as is without making any changes to settings. So come up here to build and build all levels. This looks like absolute trash. So keep in mind, I'm going to be going through the process of finding some nice settings. But if you don't want to wait through each time we rebuild our lighting, then you can wait for the very end and copy my final settings. But one thing I'm going to do to increase the quality is to go into our world settings and under light mass settings, we get access to all the different settings of our light bakes. So first off, for number of indirect lighting bounces, we want to increase this one to 10. And for number of sky lighting bounces, also increase this one to 10. For indirect lighting smoothness, I found a value of 1.3 to be good, but you can experiment with this. Just make sure it's somewhere around 1. And then for number of indirect lighting quality and static lighting level scale, these two are related to each other. So the lower the static lighting level scale and the closer it is to zero, then the more accurate lighting we get and the more detailed shadows we have. But on the flip side of that, you need to increase the indirect lighting quality to compensate. So if we have a static lighting level scale of 0.1, you want to increase that indirect lighting quality to 10. That's because 0.1 times 10 equals 1. This is very important. A general rule of thumb that you should follow is that you want your static lighting level scale times your indirect lighting quality to equal one or be around one. Now, if we're going to set our level scale to 0.2, then change your indirect lighting quality to five, for example, since 0.2 times five equals one. But in our case right now, I'm going to set it to 0.1 and increase indirect lighting quality to 10. Just know that your bake is going to be a lot slower now. Before we bake, since we did decrease the static line level scale, it's very important that under lighting quality, we set to either medium, higher production. Do not leave it on preview because then it will look really bad. So I think I'll just leave it at high for now. Go to build and build all levels. Now that our bake is finished, we can see that very slowly our bake is starting to come along, but it still looks pretty bad. We can improve this by going into the post process volume details. And let's find where ambient occlusion is right here. Ambient occlusion. Unreal is rendering some ambient occlusion in the background, but since we're baking our lights, generally our bake lighting and our textures can handle ambient occlusion by themselves. So we're going to come to intensity and just turn that off by going from 0 0.5 to 0. And immediately we can see that that does look nicer. Another thing we're going to do is, this is more stylistic, but let's select the light and just move it just a little bit like that. That's how it's almost next to the door. But one issue we do have right now, and that is if we even come up here and we can switch to lighting only, that we still don't have that much shadow detail or light detail. 
And this is because the actual textures where our shadows are being stored and our lighting is being stored are really small at this moment. We need to increase that texture size to give room for Unreal to store more data. And to do so, we could come into View Modes, Optimization View Modes, and select Light Map Density, or the shortcut is Alt and Zero. Now we can see how much density we have on each of our individual meshes. And this is pretty bad. They're blue. Generally for architectural visualization, we want to be somewhere in between green and red. So we can increase our light map textures by clicking on static mesh and within details, find where it says overridden light map resolution. And we're going to increase our light map resolution from 64 to something a lot higher like 256 or even 512 until it's in the greenish reddish area. So we're going to leave it at 512 right there and let's select the back wall. Increase this to 512. Actually, maybe maybe leave it at 256. And we do go by powers of two. You don't have to go by powers of two for your light map resolutions, but it helps with storage. So to the right, let's try 256 at the top here. Increase that to 256. Let's increase the light textures right here to 128. And we do have baseboard along the sides. So increase that to 128. And the side right here to 256. Now maybe for this chair, since the chair does have a little bit more complicated geometry, increase this to 128. And this table, try 128. Actually, let's do 256 since that wasn't dense enough. That seems good. Now let's go into lit. And as a reminder, if for some reason your static mesh doesn't contain any light textures, that's because your static mesh is set to movable. Make sure it's set to static if you do want those light textures. So come up to build and build all levels. Now, since we did increase our light map textures, it's going to take a lot longer. Here we go. Our scene is starting to look a lot nicer, but we do have a major issue with the reflections right now because in the post-process volume, we did disable lumen reflections. So we have to define what the reflections are. A way we do that is go to create visual effects and drag in a sphere reflection capture. Essentially a sphere reflection capture is kind of similar to the skylight in that it's going to take a 360 degree photo of your world and then project that onto any nearby reflections. So I'm just going to drag one into the middle of the room and I can hold down alt and do some smaller ones. That's how we have a reflection capture for this table separate from the reflection capture for this chair. So let's drag one into the chair and we can decrease the effect radius by coming up here. And instead of 3000, let's go 200. And actually let's leave the chair at 300 and select these right here and make this 200. So essentially if a reflection capture is smaller than a reflection capture, it's overlapping then that smaller one will override the larger reflection capture. So here we have one big one, one smaller one, and one that's even smaller specifically just for this table. So now let's come up to build. And instead of clicking on build all levels, we need to click on build reflection captures to get some more accurate reflections. And now our reflections look a lot nicer. I think I'm going to go into the post-process volume and everything is too bright right now. So bring down our exposure to 12. Okay. It's starting to look pretty good. If I hold alt and five to go into detail lighting, if we zoom up right here, we see some really nice soft shadows and we can even increase those soft shadows by increasing that resolution. So instead of 512. And if your bake was pretty long beforehand, I wouldn't recommend doing this unless you want to wait longer. But we go 124. And on this back wall right here, it said 256. We're going to go 512. Because I did notice that there were some issues. And this is starting to look really good. Now, if you want the best quality possible, go into World Settings, under Light Maps, Light Maps Settings, and Compress Light Maps, uncheck this. So right now it's true. So it is going to compress the light map. You can check this to make it false. So this isn't going to increase your build time, but it will increase the size of your project drastically since we're no longer compressing those textures. But I'm just gonna leave it on. Know that you can turn off compression for better shadows.
and let's come up to build and build all levels. And we are finally done with baking our lights. So this is what our scene would look like if we baked our lights and our shadows into textures and then overlaid those textures onto objects. And this gives us the benefit in that we get global illumination and it's also a lot more performant than lumen. So if I press control shift and H, we can see right now we're at 120 frames per second. If I jump into lumen, we are still at 120 frames per second. But if you don't have a powerful graphics card, if you have a mid-range graphics card, then you would probably see a change in difference. Because quite frankly, dynamic global illumination will always be a lot less performant than just baking all your global illumination beforehand. And if we zoom in right here, we can see that while we do get some nice shadows, if we jump into our baked lighting, these shadows are a lot more accurate and really nice. So baked lighting even gives better shadows and quality, but we cannot move our lights around. So for example, as soon as I move the sunlight, we just broke our lighting. You would expect there to be no lighting right now because our sun is below our world. But if we jump into our lumen scene and let's save selected, we do get that global illumination. We're slowly but surely, we no longer have any lights. So that's the difference between bake lighting and dynamic lumen lighting. It's time to talk about landscapes. And landscapes are really important for most Unreal environments because they are literally the foundation from which everything is gonna be built on top of. So in this section, we're gonna go over how you can create a very simple landscape material, how to sculpt your landscapes, and how to paint different textures onto your landscapes. But we are only scratching the surface. On my YouTube channel, I have a series that goes over different landscape tips and techniques. So go ahead and check that out if you are interested. But without further ado, let's jump into it. To begin, let's start off with a completely blank project. So I'm just going to store this on my desktop, leave it at blueprint. We don't need starter content at this point. We can always add starter content in later if we do need it. And let's call this one first landscape and create. Once your project is created, let's start from complete scratch. So press control and space, content, new folder, and call this one maps. So we're going to jump into it by creating a new level. And let's call this one landscape world. Double click to go inside it, save selected. And we have an empty void. So to create a landscape, you can probably guess that you want to go into the landscape editing mode. We are finally going to be touching this toolbar up here. So let's click on landscape. And now we have a bunch of complicated settings. When you look at the settings right here, it does look complicated, but you can reference the Unreal Engine landscape technical guide, and they have some recommended landscape sizes that you could use. So you just want to pick one of these and put in those settings. But for now, we just leave it as is and click on create. Now we have a landscape in our world, but we don't see anything. That's because we need to create our lights. So go to create lights and a directional light. Just place that in and move this one up. Let's also add in a cube just as a reference to keep it right there. Let's move our light down and set it to movable. Of course, we need a sky. So go to create visual effects, sky and atmosphere, drag that in and leave it at movable. Select your lights and make sure it's linked up with the sky and atmosphere by checking Atmosphere sunlight, turn that on. Okay, now we have some nice sky and lights. If I hold down Control and L, I can rotate this around and we can even see our sky changing color dynamically. So that's a really cool feature. We just have one issue with our lighting right now. And that is if we look at our shadow, it is pitch black. You would expect our shadow to be a little bit illuminated because the sky itself gives off lighting. And this is of course where the sky lighting comes in pretty handy. So I come to create lights and skylight. Just drag this in, make sure you set it to movable and real time capture. You always want to enable real time capture when you're trying to capture the sky and atmosphere. So make sure that's turned on. And now we have some nice lighting, hold down control and L and we can see that we can dynamically move our lights around and our skies, our skylight also change color with that movement. But our landscape lighting wouldn't be complete without some fog. So come to create, 
visual effects, and exponential high fog. But of course, we do have that problem that is when our light goes down below our world, our fogs are still illuminated. So come to settings, product settings, all settings, type in heights, and support sky atmosphere affecting height fog. Make sure that's turned on and restart the engine. Let's save. When Unreal opens up again, jump back into our level. We can see that there was no change right now, even though our sun is below our world. And that's because within the height fog, I need to make sure that fog in scattering color is set to complete darkness. And we still do have an issue because directional in scattering also needs to be set to black. But now, if we hold down Control and L, slowly raise our sun, we can see that we have some nice sun and fog zooming all the way out. Half our world is no longer just a pitch black void. Congratulations, you just lit how 90% of your outdoor scenes in Unreal Engine 5 is going to be lit. It's really simple, especially thanks to Lumen. All you need to successfully light an outdoor scene is a directional light. Make sure sky and atmosphere is turned on. A sky and atmosphere. A skylight to actually capture that sky and atmosphere and project its color onto your world. Make sure real-time capture is enabled and is set to movable. And an exponential height fog. Because without it, if you press H, our world doesn't have fog. And we do get a black void. So control H to unhide that. And if you want to control your fog, this fog actor is actually able to be controlled by using the Z. So if I raise this, we get more fog. And if I lower this, we get less fog. But actually, let me zoom out. Okay, right here, you can see it. So if you raise it up, more fog, lower it a little bit less fog. And of course, you can even control it right here. So maybe you want to increase that density and increase that fall off. So maybe just something really sharp or a lot less. That's how the fog goes up into your sky. But I'm going to click on these arrows to bring back the default settings. Finally, let's start sculpting. So click on landscape. And by default, we're in sculpt mode. Sometimes you might be in manage or paints. Make sure you're in sculpt if you actually want to deform the geometry of your landscape. And we have a little paintbrush. If you hold down left mouse button, you can increase the height of your world. Or if you hold down shift, that will decrease it. Now we can control the size of this right here within brush size. So we could bring this down or we could bring this up. If you've ever used Photoshop, then you know that the bracket keys can also control the brush size. Same thing on Unreal Engine. Control the fall off right here. Increase that so we get a smoother brush or decrease that. We get a very harsh and sharp brush. Click on the arrows to bring back the default settings and for tool strength, increase that to one. Now we get a lot of power. Hold down shift and we're going to decrease it right there. We have access to other brushes. Of course, smooth. You could probably guess what this does. It just smooths out your landscape. Get rid of some of those harsh edges. Flatten is great if you want to make terraces. Decreasing my brush size with the left bracket key. Hold down left mouse button. And now we are flattening out our world. Another one that I use often is ramp. So with the ramp tool, hold down control, left mouse button, and hold down control and left mouse button again. So we get these two actors. I can raise each of them to different degrees. So maybe I want this one at the ground, move it a little bit far, and this one go up just a little bit and select add ramp. That will automatically paint in that geometry and fill it in. I use that tool often if there's a precise angle I'm trying to get. And we have some other brushes you can play with. But I'm going to jump to manage. And maybe if your landscape is too big or too small, you can add in more components by clicking on add. And then left mouse button. So left mouse button to make your landscape bigger. You can also just paint this in by holding down the left mouse button. Or maybe your landscape is a bit too big, then you could delete them by clicking on delete and deleting them just like this. Also, you're able to resize the landscape. So maybe you do want some more detail in your landscape if you hold Alt and 2. One of the good things about landscape is that detail grows and shrinks depending on how far away you are from the landscape. So if we're really far, 
we see those vertices shrink. But if I get really close, we get more and more detail. And you can get even more detail by using the resize tool. And instead of one by one, maybe do two by two, and then set a resize mode, you click on resample. I'm not gonna click apply right now because unfortunately with this build of Unreal Engine, there's a glitch where Unreal crashes. This should be fixed in the future. So we can ignore that for now. And then we have paint. Paint is used for painting different landscape layers when you have a landscape material. But unfortunately for us, we have no landscape layers since we don't have a landscape material. And that's what we're gonna go over right now, creating our first landscape material. Now landscapes can be pretty complicated. This material won't be anything too complicated. It'll just be the very basics, but it'll help you get started. And before we jump into that, something I do with all my levels is add in a human reference. Because right now it's kind of hard to tell the sizes of these different hills and mountains. So to add in a human reference, press control and space. Let's go add, add a feature or content pack. And we're gonna use third person since that does come with the mannequin. Add to project. And we will have the mannequin right here. Come to characters, mesh, dragon, SK underscore mannequin to get a better sense of our scale. Okay, so that one does make sense. Looking good. I'm gonna hold down control and L because we are at a pretty harsh angle. Bring that up just a little bit. Press control and space. We can see that third person did add in a bunch of other folders that we don't really need. We do not need the geometry folder. I can delete this. It's gonna say that some of the assets are being referenced by other assets. That's fine, we can force delete. And third person, third person BP. Also delete those and save everything. To create a landscape material, we're just gonna create a normal material. So press control and space. Well, let's create a new folder. Plus one materials, right click, new material, M underscore landscape. Double click on this, dock our material right here. So the way we tell Unreal that this isn't just any normal material, this is a landscape material, is by right clicking and placing a special node called a landscape layer and select layer blend. This node looks kind of weird and that there is no inputs. That's fine, we need to come down into the details panel and click on this plus icon. So it's gonna ask us to name it. We have one input right now. I'm gonna call this one grass and press plus again. Call this one dirt. Essentially what we're doing right now is creating brand new landscape layers. And with this node, it will give us the ability to paint different layers within our level. So for dirt, I'm just gonna use a very simple color right now. We will replace this with textures in just a bit, but make this pure green, okay. And then for dirt, press Control and W, and make this kind of darkish. Also the shortcut is holding down three and left clicking to bring in a color node in case you forgot and place that there. Actually, that's maybe a little bit too bright of green. So bring down that color and hook it up to base color right there like this. Make sure you press apply and save within our landscape. Now we can't just drag this onto our world. Instead, we need to select our landscape and come down here into the landscape slot Press control space and drag it into the slot just like that. And our world is a very nasty black right now since we need to start assigning different layers. Go back into landscape mode by clicking on the button or we could press shift two as a shortcut. And now we have two different layers. We can't just start painting our layers. We first need to actually create a layer and save it into our content browser. So to create a layer, simply click on the small little plus icon and weight blended layer normal. By default, Unreal will create a folder where our map is located with our map's name. That's fine, we can leave it as is, or you could pretty much save it anywhere you want. And it's gonna call it by its layer name and layer info. I think we can also leave that as is. And now we have our grass layer. Let's add in our dirt, click on the plus icon, weight blended layer normal, and create a dirt layer info. So under maps, we have a brand new folder and this folder contains our landscape layers. Save everything and select our dirt. 
and now see that when I do decrease this size, it takes a bit to compile, but we are able to paint in that dirt, giving us the editor a lot of control over what our landscape should look like. Press shift one to go back into place actors mode, leaving our landscape mode and our landscape. It works. It gets the technical job done, but this looks terrible. So we need to replace our solid colors with some nice textures with roughness, normal, everything we would want. But unfortunately we don't have any textures right now. We could add some textures by going control space, add feature or content pack, and then our starter content. But those textures aren't really that good. Or we can use Unreal's Mega Scan library by clicking on Add Quixel Content. So select it. And you want to sign into your Epic Games account, the same account you use to download Unreal Engine, by clicking right here and clicking Sign In. Once you're signed in, you have access to 15,784 assets at the time of recording. Epic Games is adding more and more assets as the day go by. Everything you see here is free to download and it works perfectly automatically with Unreal Engine 5. So that is pretty amazing that Unreal already comes with a massive asset library ready to go. Now let's go to surfaces and we can find some grass right there. Pretty much pick any grass. I think we could just use this wild grass for now and we can select the quality of the texture. So medium quality, is 2K, low quality is 1K, high quality is 4K, and highest quality is 8K. I think we could just leave it at 2K for now, so select medium quality, and select download. Once your download is finished, you can select add to bring it into your project, or you can hover over the icon and select that button right there. Let's also find a dirt texture. So exit, I'm just gonna type in dirt, and Actually, just go in surfaces because I didn't really bring up what I wanted. Select soil. I like this one right here. Excavated mud. Download. And add. Exit out of bridge. Come down into your content drawer. And we see we have a brand new folder called Mega Scans. Within Mega Scans is a folder called Surfaces. And within surfaces, we have our mud material, exit a surface, and our wild grass. If you want to see all the textures that are located within surfaces, then we can use a filter. So click on filters right here and select texture. The content browser is grabbing all the textures that are located within surfaces. So if we go to excavated mud, it's only going to grab the textures that are in excavated mud. If we click on content, then we see all the textures that are currently within our project. So let's go to surfaces. And now that we have access to those textures, jump into M underscore landscape, press control and space, hold down shift to select all of them and simply drag it into our graph like that. Well, let's handle base color first. So let's move these down and move these ones up. Actually, we're going to reverse them because I want grass to be on top, dirt to be on bottom. Get the color textures and plug it up right here like this. Press apply. Jumping back into our world, we can see exactly what just happened. And now our camera is getting really bright. That's because of exposure. So at this point, we're going to add in a post process volume and infinite extend unbound. Exposure set to manual. And let's leave it at 11 for now. And it looks like that we have successfully been able to switch out that solid color with a texture, but we still need to handle roughness. So going into M underscore landscape, let's go and open up this material because you might be thinking, wait, this doesn't really look like a roughness mask. We'll open it up. And then if we uncheck green and blue, we can see the red channel. Then we can see the green channel, which is the roughness map. So just like beforehand within the material chapter, by default within bridge, it's going to wrap a lot of different textures together within one mask. Now that we know where our roughness is, jump back into our landscape and let's move these right here. And we need to duplicate our layer blend by pressing control and W. 
So we control W duplicated, drag from G, which is roughness into our layer blend, and then drag this into roughness. Press apply. And within landscape world, we see that our roughness is taking effect. Two issues. Number one, I like to artificially bring down my specular value since landscapes are way too specular to begin with. And number two, we're gonna add in the normal map. So jump back into our landscape, hold down one, left click for specular, maybe a value of 0 0.2. Since by default specular is at 0 0.5, so we are lowering that. Grab both of our normal maps, press control and W, and hook it up just like this. Bring that into normal like that. Press apply, jump back into our world. And our landscape is starting to actually look like a landscape. We are going to make some more changes, but right now the biggest issue I have is with the organization of our landscape material. That's because if we jump into our landscape material, and let's say I want to add another landscape layer, maybe some sand, then I'm going to click on layer blend, add in a new layer with the plus icon, and down here we're going to call this one sand. But now I'm going to have to go through every single layer blend and add in that brand new layer. And that is such a hassle. And not to mention right now, this node graph does look messy. So instead of using three different layer blends, we're only going to use one layer blend. So let's delete these. Also, while I'm at it, we could get rid of the sand because that was just for demonstration by clicking on that arrow and clicking delete. Let's move our textures back. Also, hold on alt to break connections. Move these back. And we're going to use a brand new node that I use all the time. Right click called make material attributes. So as you can see, the inputs of this node line up with our output node. And that's because you could think of a material attribute as a sub material. So we're creating materials within materials. Press control W to duplicate that make material attributes. And we're going to move the dirt textures down here and the grass textures up here. So you could probably get a sense of what's happening right now. Within grass, base color, roughness, normal, base color, roughness, and normal. Just like that. And now we're going to output right there, break connections. The output goes in the dirt. I'm going to have to break the connection for the specular and just hook up 0 0.2 into these nodes specular. So specular right there, specular right there. And instead of an output node that has all the different channels available within the details with this selected, I'm going to click on use material attributes. So it's going to ask for material attribute. And since this layer blend is blending in between two different material attributes, it's going to output a material attribute into our output node. Highlight all these, move this up, press the C key as a comment. Grass material, maybe make this green because this is grass. And at the bottom right here, I like this, press C. This is our dirt material. And make this a dark brown. Apply, save. And within our landscape world, we pretty much have the same exact material, but now our material graph looks a lot nicer. So maybe we can make some changes where we can scale our textures. So right click, go texture coordinates and hold down M, left click, hold down S and left click for a scalar value. Call us one grass tile and give it a default value of one. Plug it up like this and hook it up just like that. Press apply, jump into landscape world. And we're going to create a material instance. So go into our materials, right click on landscape, create material instance, press escape. And we're going to use this material instance. So drop it on our landscape material. Also save everything. I would hate for Unreal to crash and we lose all our progress. Open up our material instance. Zoom up to our mannequin. Zoom in. 
And with those parameters for grass tile, we can decrease it to 0.5 to make things bigger or increase it to make it a lot smaller, but we do want it to be bigger. So maybe a value of 0 0.4. Okay, 0 0.4 is looking pretty nice. Let's do the same thing for our dirt. So come in our landscape. And I do notice we switch the textures. So this is excavated mud. Hold on alt to break it. Down here is the grass texture. So hook it back up. Highlight this, press control C and control and V. So grass tile, rename this to dirt tile. We're going to use the same texture coordinates because after all, we are using the same landscape. Hook up the UVs. And while I'm at it, let's also give ourselves the ability to color tint. Just a little bit bigger. Hold down M and left click. Hold down three and left click. Right click, convert to parameter. Call this one grass tint. Default value of white. That's how it's not affecting the color of our material by default. Come down here, hold down M, and for multiply, hold down three, right click, convert to parameter, dirt tints, make this one white, press OK, hook it up like that, and then for base color right there like this. Okay, so this is looking pretty nice. I don't like how this 0 0.2 scalar value is overlapping with our other nodes. Hold on Alt to break that. So I'm just going to have two different ones up here. So one for grass and one for dirt. Okay, nice. So we basically have two different materials, one grass and one dirt within one larger landscape material. And this is generally how I like to organize my landscapes because it makes our material much more readable. Jump back into our map and enter landscape editing mode. Within paint, dirt. Paint some dirt right next to our character. Go back into place actors. And we have access to these. Go dirt tile. Let's try zero points. 0.25 looks pretty good, but I do think our dirt is a little bit too bright. So we could bring that down right here. Press OK. And that's looking a little bit more realistic. Maybe give it kind of like a greenish tint. Now it's sort of blending with the grass a lot better. And I'd say at this point, we are done editing our landscape. We will come back to our landscape later for virtual textures. But really quickly, you can imagine that as you add more parameters to both our grass and our dirt, our little material instance will be harder and harder to read. But we can fix this by separating out our parameters based on whether it's grass or it's dirt. And this is where parameter groups come in really handy. So if I select any parameter, come down here to group, we can call this grass. And then right here within the dropdown, we now have access to grass. So select that. Down here, let's create a new one, call this one dirt. Select that. Within the drop down, select dirt. Press apply. And now within our material instance, we can see that we have dirt, dirt tile, dirt tint, and a nice group, and grass also within its own group. So that is the very basics of creating a landscape material within Unreal Engine 5. Obviously, I'd say this landscape material and this landscape in general isn't really good. Luckily, I do have a series that you could check out right now. Link should be up in the right-hand corner where I go over how we can improve that material and make better, more realistic looking landscapes. But we're going to have to move on. That's how we could talk about the foliage mode. So to get into the foliage mode, it's pretty simple. Just like how you click up here to get a landscape mode, the button right next to it is the foliage mode and the shortcut is shift three. So it says drop foliage here. It's asking for some static meshes. And you might be wondering, hey, where do I get some nice foliage meshes? 
Well, of course, go to content drawer, add, add Quixel content, or the shortcut for that is clicking on content and going to Quixel bridge. So let's double click on this and let's try to find some nice grass. So I go to 3D plants. Let's see what ferns are available. So common fern. I'm actually going to select prickly shield fern because I haven't downloaded that yet. And we have medium, high quality, and highest quality. Low quality is 1K, medium quality is 2K, high quality is 4K, and finally highest quality is 8K. I think we could just stick with medium quality for now. And the vertices of our meshes increase the higher the quality. So let's download it. And add. Exit out of bridge. And within our content drawer, let's save everything. So save all. And we can see our meshes right here. Under 3D plants, mega scans. So I can select all of these, holding down shift. And simply drop the foliage here. As Unreal says to do. Okay, nice. So now that we have our foliage in here, you can paint foliage by having paint selected right there and left click holding. So left click hold to paint. We can increase that paint density. That's how we paint more. Or we could decrease it to paint less. If we want to paint away some of these meshes, we hold down shift and simply go like this. But there is a glitch where it looks like the vertices start to spaz out. That's fine. It's not engine breaking. And if we only want to paint a specific mesh, then we need to come in here and uncheck the meshes we don't want to paint. And we can see that they're no longer highlighted. And I just want to paint this mesh right here. Then left click hold. And we can see we're only painting one kind of mesh. We can also change the density of that one specific mesh down here under density. So let's increase the density to one. And we can see that this is the density that's currently given. If we increase this from 100 to 500, now I can imagine this is going to be a lot, and it is a lot more. We can also play with the size, so the scale right now is minimum 1, maximum 1. If we do it 1 to 5, then whenever we spawn a mesh, it's going to pick a random value in between 1 and 5. So we see that we get small ones, and we also get pretty large ones. We can always reset the values by clicking on the arrow and press a control and Z to undo those changes. Click on the arrow again. Let's fly over here to the hill. And as you notice, our foliage is angled to our landscape. If we don't want that to happen, then we need to uncheck align to normal. Now our foliage will always be pointing up. It took me a while to see because I thought something was wrong, but this foliage is pointing up right now. It's just pretty hard to see. And we can make a bunch of other changes. If we really like our settings for the specific mesh, we can save those settings by hovering over that mesh and clicking on the save icon. And we can pick a location, click on save. And now we have access to that setting right there. We can always drag it back in there if we make any changes. If I hover over the foliage, we can see that they're all right now deselected. So if I try to paint, nothing will happen. If I want to quickly select all of them, then I can hold down Control and A to select everything and then hover over that button and select it. So now that they're all activated, I can once again go through and paint all of them. If I want to deselect all of them, then I can press Control and A again and deselect them. That's pretty much the gist of full editing. It's important. So let's go select the first one again. It's important to know that when you are painting, it will paint on top of static meshes. So this little box right here, if we paint. There was one mesh that spawned on top of it. If we don't want that to happen, let's delete them. Then we need to uncheck static meshes. And now we're no longer painting on top of it. So just know that that is an option. Or if for some reason you're unable to paint on your landscape, make sure filters landscape is turned on. Another tool I use all the time is select. So if I want to move an individual foliage, then I come in here with a select tool and simply select it like that. And now I'm able to move it around individually, scale them and rotate them as if it's an individual mesh. All right. So the two new game changing features of Unreal Engine 5 is number one, Lumen, which we have already gone over and number two, Nanite. And Nanite is amazing because it's a new way of managing geometry which allows us to get highly detailed static meshes with poly counts in the millions into Unreal Engine 
at very little performance costs. And you would know why this is a big deal if you've ever sculpted a high poly mesh in Blender and then Blender starts to slow down. That doesn't exist in Unreal Engine 5 if you are using Nanite. And what's amazing is that Nanite is just one button press away. So before we go over Nanite, there are some caveats. And that is Nanite doesn't work with static meshes that deform. So don't use it on your characters. And it also doesn't work for foliage like grass and leaves. But other than that, if you have a static mesh in your world, might as well enable Nanite for more detail and higher performance. So let's jump back into Unreal. Now that you know Nanite is a game changer, you might be wondering how do we activate Nanite within our Unreal Engine 5 projects? Well, it's pretty simple, but first we need a demo mesh. And we're going to get that, of course, from Quixel Bridge. So let's find a 3D asset. And we could pretty much select anything. I'm just going to select this Nordic Coastal Cliff. We can see that we have low quality, medium quality, high quality, and nanite quality. I'm going to select high quality. We will go over what nanite quality is in just a bit and download it. Add to project. Move this window off to the side. Press control and space. We see under mega scans, we have a new folder, 3D assets. And in 3D assets is our mesh. So let's rotate it. And here we have a nice coastal cliff. Hold Alt and 2. It is pretty dense. And to activate Nanite, all you have to do is press Control and E as a shortcut to open up its editor and click Enabled under Nanite Settings and press Apply Changes. Now we could get out. And this is a Nanite mesh. That was pretty easy. Another way and a much faster way to enable Nanite is to press Control and B. Control B will simply find the location of whatever asset you have selected in your world. So for example, if we select this mannequin and press Control B, Unreal will find where that mannequin is in our content browser. A shortcut to enable Nanite is to select this mesh, press Control B, right click on that mesh, Nanite, and click on Enabled. So that's another option for that. And we could tell it's a Nanite mesh, since if I go into Lit, Nanite Visualization, Triangles, we see that when I go far away, we get less triangles. And when I come up close, we get more triangles. So we see that dynamic LOD in action. So that's how you enable Nanite. But what happens if you download a Nanite asset straight from Bridge? Well, we could select one by coming down here to Nanite, press download, and keep in mind your download might take a while because we're downloading the best quality possible. These are AK textures with a very high poly count often going above 1 million triangles. So jumping back into Unreal, press Control and Space, we can see we have a brand new asset, go through the assets, massive Nordic Coastal Cliff. Simply drag that in, and if we come up to Lit, Nanite Visualization, Triangles, we can see that automatically Unreal decided to import this as a Nanite Mesh. That's because we do have a pretty dense mesh right now. If I press Control B to find in my content browser, right click, go to Nanite, and disable it. We can see exactly how dense this mesh is. If we press Alt and 2, this mesh is so dense I pretty much can't even tell the difference between the triangles. And if we press Control and E, let's drag it up here, we can see how many triangles we have. And this one asset has 1 million triangles. That's the kind of quality you would expect to see in a Marvel movie, not within a gaming engine. Re-enable Nanite and apply changes. Let's get out of the static mesh editor. Jump back into Lit, and let's demonstrate just how powerful Nanite is by duplicating this rock out a bunch of different times. Each of these rocks have 1 million polygons of source geometry, and there are 6 of them, so right now there are 6 million triangles. Select this some more, and just keep on copying and pasting them out. Over and over again, and we are still at 120 frames. We could pretty much do this for a while until we actually see Unreal Engine start to slow down. And that is absolutely amazing that Unreal Engine has this ability ready to go without any setup whatsoever. And it is oddly satisfying to go into Lit, Nanite, and Triangles to just look at all the triangles that are currently on our screen, zooming in and zooming out, seeing those triangles get bigger, and see those triangles split into even smaller triangles as we get close to the mesh because Unreal knows that we need to render more polys for more detail. And this is one of my favorite features of Unreal Engine 5, 
because it gives us near infinite geometry. And it removes one of the hurdles of real-time rendering, that is LODs, allowing us to use movie quality assets without worrying about frame rate. We're going to put Nanite on hold right now because we are going to be using it a lot within the Monkey Shrine build. But before we move on, let's go over the different material parameters that we have with Megascan Bridge Assets. So I'm going to select this asset right here and let's open up its material instance and we can see that we get a bunch of different options. So I'm just going to run down them real quickly. First off, we have Albedo Tint. Pretty self-explanatory. Allows us to just slightly tint our mesh. Give it a different color and feel. Next up is Albedo Controls. If you're new to Unreal, then you might activate it. Then click it right here and then start moving the color around and being confused at what exactly is happening. That's because you shouldn't play with it as a color. Instead, within the drop down, so clicking on the arrow, we see that we have saturation, brightness, and contrast. So you can think of color as a wrapper for several different parameters. Let's reset it back to 111. Saturation, self-explanatory. Makes our mesh more saturated. Bring it to zero, just a black and white mesh. Brightness makes it brighter or even darker. Let's go 0.7 because I did notice that mesh was too bright. And contrast, of course, controls the contrast of that mesh. Just leaving it at one for now. Then we have metallic controls. If you do have a metallic material, then these parameters will come in helpful, but we don't. So we can click away from that. And we have base specular and specular from albedo. Generally with rocks and other natural assets, you want to decrease your specular value and bring it below Unreal's default 0.5. Pretty similar to Blender, which also has a default specular value of 0.5. We can view the specular maps of our world by coming to lit, buffer visualization, and selecting specular to see exactly what's happening. Right now it's at 0.5, which is Unreal's default. If we use one, then it's going to decrease everything and bring it below 0.5, depending on our base color which is what we're going to be doing for most of our rock assets and natural assets. Next up is roughness. Let's go back into lit and pretty self-explanatory. If we bring our max roughness down from one to 0 0.5 or just to zero, then our rock will be a lot shinier. Can't really see it right now. It is hard to see from this angle, but just know that we can leave it at one, which is its default normal strength. Pretty self-explanatory. Increase that normal, more normal. Bring it to zero for no normal. And then we have our texture maps and our roughness and displacement map. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Most Quixel assets share the same exact parameters. I believe one of the big differences is for foliage, like right here, because they also include subsurface scattering. So let's find where our foliage is by going into Megascan, 3D Plants, and Foliage. Let's select this one, bring out the details, and we can control that subsurface scattering right here. We can change the color variation. That's how each of these individual foliage pieces will have their own color. So bring it to one. <laughs> Pretty intense, but you can see what exactly is happening. So maybe leaving it at a value of 0.05 is a good middle ground. We even have color overlay. If you do want to tint that color just a little bit. Below here, roughness, intensity, opacity, normal. Those are self-explanatory. And then we have translucency. So enabling these. We can decrease this translucency to zero. Now we don't have that much subsurface scattering or bring that up to 10 for a lot of subsurface scattering. And we have grass and wind. So if we enable this, enable wind, then we can see our foliage slowly moving back and forth. Now there is an issue with Unreal Engine right now, and that is wind in Unreal Engine uses world position offsets. And world position offset doesn't really work that well with Lumen at this moment. So you might see some artifacts with your foliage. If that does happen, then you want to make sure you bring down your that wind intensity. Unreal is aware of this issue and in the future will be fixed. But if you do see artifacts, you should decrease the intensity of your wind. We are almost ready to create our monkey shrine, but there are three more topics we need to go over beforehand. And that is migrating assets between projects, virtual textures, and HDRIs. To begin, let's go over something pretty important and that is moving assets in between projects. Because after all, if you do spend a lot of time working on a specific asset, you would want to be able to move that asset into another project. That's how you don't have to remake it from complete scratch. So to do so, included in the downloadable content is the monkey shrine, open up the project folder, and let's launch this project. So we're gonna have two projects open at the same time. Our new project we open up is pretty simple. It's just a collection of assets we're gonna use 
when creating our monkey shrine, but there's one particular asset, which is on our monkey shrine auto landscape called MF underscore VT ground blend that I want to bring into our old project to help us when we're going over virtual textures. So to copy one asset into another project, it's pretty simple. You want to go into the project that you're moving the asset into, go into the content, right click on the content folder, and then go show in Explorer. This will jump into your project folders content folder. So if we come out, we can see the first landscape. This is our project folder where everything is stored. And then it jumped into our content folder. The reason why we want to be in our content folder is because we're going to copy the location of that. And now go into the project with the asset you're trying to migrate, right click on that asset, come up to asset actions and select migrate. So it's going to tell us that the following assets will be migrated to another content folder. All we want to migrate is MF underscore VT ground blend. That is fine. Click OK. And now we need to direct our file explorer to the location of our content folder. We copy the location beforehand. So we could just control and V to paste that in. And now we're in the first landscape content folder, go select folder. And it says content migration completed successfully. So within our original project, we can see that we have a new folder called monkey shrine and a monkey shrine is auto landscape. And right here is our custom asset we brought from another project. So that's pretty simple. It doesn't get rid of that asset in the original project. It simply just copies it over and any references to other assets. So let's drag this into our materials, move here, and then let's delete those folders since we don't need them. And here's a tip. Whenever you're moving assets around, generally you want to right click on content folder and click on fix up redirectors in folder. If you move a lot of assets and you don't fix up redirectors, then that could cause issues down the line. And now we have our nice custom asset that we're going to use to go over virtual textures. So virtual textures are pretty amazing. They can do a lot of different stuff, but for this tutorial, we're going to only go over the most common feature of virtual textures. And that is how to blend our meshes with our landscape. Because right now, if we take, let's say this rock right here and just move it into this hill, it, it doesn't really look that realistic. It looks like just a 3d object that's sticking out of some polygons which is exactly what we don't want and which is where virtual textures are going to come in really handy. Virtual textures will allow us to seep some of our landscape material onto our actual mesh, which will make it look a lot more realistic. So to begin, we first need to open up our landscape material. So let's scroll down, double click on the landscape inst, and we can open up the parent material by just double clicking on the M underscore landscape at the bottom here. So now that we have our landscape open up, we need to add in a brand new node called runtime virtual texture output select that and we can see that it's kind of similar to our original output node in that we have a lot of inputs like base color specular roughness and we have a unique input called world height which we will go over in just a bit but essentially what this node allows us to do is capture some data from our landscape to be able to project it onto our static meshes in our world to create a blend effect now we need a way to get base color specular roughness but unfortunately for us, this output right here is only giving us a material attribute node. If you remember a material attribute, and we do create material attributes right here, is essentially a way to collect multiple material channels into one channel. So we're going to have to break this by dragging from here, go to break, and break material attributes. So now we have access to that base color and specular. Hook up base color there. Spec. Roughness. Normal. We can ignore opacity and mask, but we need an input for world height. Essentially, we need to get the location of a pixel on our material, and we can do that with world position. So select world position, leave it as is, but we don't want the world position for X, Y, and Z. We only want to isolate out Z. So to only get the Z, we need to drag from here and go component mask and make sure only B is turned on. So deselect G and deselect R. So now we are getting our world position, but we're isolating only the Z axis. And we're going to hook this up into world heights just like that and press apply. This by itself won't do anything because we need to create a virtual texture from which all this data will be stored. So let's jump into our world, press control space and right click, go to materials and textures. And we should see runtime virtual texture. So create it, call this one RVT underscore height. And we're going to duplicate it because we want two of them, one to store height and one to store the material data, like our base color and roughness. But before we do anything else, you need to make sure that you enable virtual textures within your project settings, go to settings, project settings, and all settings, virtual textures, 
and enable. Now, one thing that might be annoying when you do enable virtual textures is that down here for auto virtual texturing size, instead of 496, when you make this something larger, because by default, when it is 496, that means whenever we import a texture that's above 496 pixels, that's going to be imported as a virtual texture, which will then mess up some of our materials, which is why this setting is really high so that we don't have that auto import feature and click restart now and save selected. When your project has restarted, jump back into your map and it might take a while for your shaders to compile. But in the meantime, go to materials and for RVT underscore height, double click on it. And we're going to set this to world height since after all, this is going to be storing our height data. So save. And then for RVT underscore material, we can leave this as is. It might say landscape physical material needs to be rebuilt. We could come up to build and build all levels, but I wouldn't suggest doing that right now because then it will build lighting also. So to avoid that, where it's not going to build lighting, you need to go into world settings. If you don't have world settings, make sure you come to windows and select world settings right there. And within the drop down for light mass and advanced options, make sure force no pre cubicle lighting is turned on. If it's turned on, then we're not going to have any baked lighting. So we can just build our level just like that. So now we need to specify the bounds from which our virtual textures are capturing our landscape data. And to do so, come up to create volumes, come down all the way to here and grab the runtime virtual texture volume, or you could just type in runtime and it should come up, drag it out. It's pretty small right now. We want this to encompass everything that we're capturing. So let's move this pretty far over there, maybe for scale. Set this to 5,000, move it down. That's how it's inside the ground. Okay. That was 50,000, not 5,000. Set it like that. And then we can make right here for the X value, 10,000. And copy this, 10,000 for the Y. So everything within this bound is going to be captured and project it onto a static mesh. Just like that. Let's drag in a virtual texture. So this is going to be our height. And press Control and W to duplicate it and create a brand new runtime virtual texture. And this one is going to be our material. So drag material onto it. Now we aren't capturing our data just yet. That's because I need to click on the landscape. Scroll down until we see virtual textures. Click on the button twice to add in two virtual textures and drag in our height and our material. You can already see within the little thumbnails that we are capturing our data. So down here is our base color and our roughness and up above is our height. So while we are capturing our data successfully, we aren't putting that data anywhere. So we need to specify on the static mesh that I want to use these virtual textures and blend it with the landscape. And this is where that custom asset we brought in through migration is going to come in really handy. So begin, let's open up the parent material of this material instance. Just double click on the material instance. And at the very bottom, we can open up its parent material. If you want to know where this parent material is located, we can click on the little magnifying glass icon and we can see it's under MS presets and M underscore default fuzz material. So double click on that. Now we have the mega scan master material open for nanite assets. And this might look a little bit complicated, but to be honest, everything right here really doesn't matter. The only edit we're going to make is press control and space, go into our materials, grab that asset that we migrated from the monkey shrine assets and drag it into my graph just like that. If we zoom in onto this node, we can see that's asking for a material attribute as its input, and then it's going to output a material attribute. Now, lucky for us. The way this material is set up is that it's already outputting a material attribute. So we just drag from right here into it like that. Since this node is given a material attribute, we can tell because the input is MA right there and the output is material attribute. Drag it up just like that. And that is pretty much it. Essentially what these blue nodes are, are material functions. Material functions are just a shader graph that's reusable, very similar to blenders groups. And we could double click to go into a material function. Nothing showed up because the windows we have open right now are floating on top of our main Unreal Graph. We need to drag this aside and we can see that it did open up right here within the main tab. 
And if we zoom out, we can see exactly what this custom node is. This might look pretty complicated, but it really isn't. On the top right hand corner, you can see a link to a video where I explain pretty much everything that's going on. So if you are interested in creating a node like this completely from scratch, then go ahead and check out that video. But we need to make two changes. And that is right here. It says add virtual textures. So we need to place our virtual texture color, which is our material right here. Press control space and drag in RVT material into the slot. We move this down right there. And then for height, drag in the height right there. Just like that. Press apply. And then within our master material, also press apply. Now we can exit out of everything. And we can see exactly what is happening right now. We see that there is a very nice blend going on in between the landscape and our mesh. We can even move this around and we can see that change happening dynamically. So here we are, slowly goes into the landscape and it disappears and it comes out. So let's go into a more flat area and keep in mind, we need to be inside of our runtime virtual texture. Let's see where it is. You can always make this runtime virtual texture bigger. And if you do have a really large runtime virtual texture, then make sure you go into your virtual texture settings. And then you can increase the pixel size by maybe instead 256, you make this 10, 1024, but I'm just going to leave it at 256 for now. Also, if there's ever glitches with your virtual textures, then make sure you build your level. So let's go and we can even see that it works. Moving this down. It respects the landscape layers. So we even get dirt and grass right here, which is really amazing. So let's go over what some of the settings are for this. So double click, open it up and our custom material node. It did come with a bunch of settings all the way down here. We see virtual textures. So we can enable and disable the virtual textures by selecting that Boolean. So here it is off and here it is on. And we can even control that fall off. So maybe you want to be a lot harsher Then we could decrease it or we can increase that and have more dirt on top of it. Change the virtual height. And by default right now, I have removed sides turned on. If I turn this off, then my virtual texture will also affect the really harsh angles. But obviously, since this is a top down projection, we're going to get that nasty texture stretching, which is why remove sides is turned on by default. So that is the gist of virtual textures within Unreal Engine. We're going to be using this heavily for the monkey shrine because quite frankly, this is the best way to blend your assets with your landscape and virtual textures are also helpful for other things. And going into the future with this channel, we will be revisiting them very often. Also, one thing I do notice with this asset is that this asset is pretty bright. So we can still decrease it and we still have access to all of our original parameters. So go to albedo controls, brightness, we can decrease that and notice that the changes I make to my asset do not affect our virtual textures. There we go like that. Our blend is pretty nice. Now it's time to talk about HDRIs and how to light your scene with them. Now, so far throughout this lesson, we've been lighting our scenes with just unreal sky and atmosphere and unreal sky and atmosphere is really amazing. It's a realistic sky, hold down control and L. We're able to move our sun around. And as we move our sun, our sky changes dynamically. So I'd say for most cases, I just stick with unreal sky and atmosphere. We can also add in clouds by coming to great visual effects and volumetric clouds, drag it in. And our world has some really nice clouds and these clouds are also affected by our sky and atmosphere. So we can see the shadow that's being casted by the clouds change as I move my sun around. In two seconds, just by rotating our sun, we're able to get a beautiful sunset sky. It's absolutely amazing that Unreal comes with this by default. But if you are a Blender user, then you're probably used to lighting your scenes with HDRIs. So that's what we're going to go over real quickly, just in case if you do want that option. First off, to demonstrate HDR lighting, let's create a duplicate of our world. So press control space, maps, and call this one HDRI, duplicate with control and W, double click on it. Let's save everything. 
And then in here, we're going to delete our lights. So we don't need our directional lights, sky and atmosphere, our clouds, delete those. And we also have fog right now. So let's find where our exponential height fog is and delete that. We do need our skylights and skylight is how we're going to light our world with an HDRI, but we're going to uncheck real time capture. Now we're using all the default values of our skylights. And at this point, we do need an HDRI. If you're a Blender user, then I'm assuming you're already getting your HDRIs from Polyhaven by Greg Zhao. It's absolutely amazing. There's 400 different HDRIs you can pick from. They're all high quality. So just feel to download any one. It really doesn't matter, but you can pick any of them. If you do want to follow along exactly, you can download this guy. And congratulations, because recently they did earn an Epic Games Mega Grant. So obviously, all these HDRIs work really well in Unreal Engine. To import an HDRI, it's the same process as importing any texture. So let's go Content Drawer, Dock and Layout, go into our Materials, or we can create a new folder. But I'm just going to place in my materials for now and simply drag that HDRI into there like that. So let's double click on our HRI because we need to change some of the settings here. So first off, Unreal does some dynamic compression in the background with your textures through MIP maps. We don't want any compression. We want this texture to be as sharp as possible. So in MIP gen settings, make sure no MIP maps is selected. And then for compression settings, check HDR. Unreal smart enough to realize that this is probably an HDRI texture. So it already have that for us. And make sure sRGB is unchecked because we do want that full color range. Okay, great. Now let's jump back into our world. And you can probably guess that the way we do light a scene right now is through the skylight. Because after all, the skylight will project light onto our scene from all different directions, which is perfect for HDRIs. So for source type in our skylight, we're going to change it from captured scene to specify cube map. Now, let's save our HDRI and drag it right there. We can see exactly what is happening in our scene. So we're able to increase the intensity of that HDRI or even decrease it to 1, 0 0.5 for a very faint intensity or light. And if I make my details panel just a little bit bigger and move this to the side, that's how we can read. We have source cube map angle. So I can rotate this around and you can kind of see it updating in real time where we're able to change the rotation of that HDRI. And this is great, but obviously we do have an issue. And that is our texture isn't showing up in the background. We get a pitch black sky, which is obviously not good. So instead we're going to use our HDRI in a material. So let's jump into materials, right click, let's create a new material, M underscore HDRI, and double click to go inside of it. So we're going to use our current HDRI and simply drag it into our graph and make sure linear color is selected for sampler type. We don't want any shadows on this material. So just click anywhere within our graph and within shading model, change it from default lit to unlit. Now we have emissive color. We're going to drag it into it just like that. But we have an issue that is it's saying UVW input required for cube map sample. So we're going to do a little bit of vector math. You do not need to know what's happening at this point, but hold down three and left click. Keep this three vector at zero, 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 drag from here and then type in reflection vector. So let's choose reflection vector world space and keep it as is. And then we're going to drag from here and type in transform vector. Change it from world space to local space. Cause right now by default it's tangent space to world space. So source is world space and destination is local space. And then hook it up like that and press apply. We also want to give ourselves the ability to control the intensity of an HDRI. So hold down M and left click. Hook it up like this, hold down S and left click for a scalar parameter, call this one intensity. And for a default value, we need it to be one because if it's zero, then we won't get anything for a default value. There we go. And of course, this is just like any other shader in Unreal Engine. You can add in a color tint. So maybe make this pure white and use a multiply. Or if you want to control the contrast of a texture, then we need to use the power node. So right click, type in power. Select it right there, hook this up to base, hold down S and left click, and call this contrast. So for intensity, we use multiply, and for contrast, we use a power node. For a contrast, that default value will be one. Hook it up like this, and right there into emissive color. Press apply, and save. Hop back into our world, and we need a mesh that we're gonna put our brand new material onto. But before we do that, 
let's reset all the values of my skylight. So click on that and click on that for the arrows. Go into content drawer. And the mesh I specifically want to use is already included in Unreal Engine, but it's included in a semi-hidden folder called engine content. If you do not see your engine content folder, then come to settings and make sure show engine content is enabled. Now within the engine content folder, I'm going to type in sky and let's use the SM underscore sky sphere. So just drag this in and now press control space, go into materials and drag our HRI onto it just like that. Actually, let's create a material instance. That's how we have access to those parameters to play with. And if we zoom out, obviously this HRI is a little bit too small at this point. So I could try to keep on scaling it up and up and up, or I could click on this lock icon right here, which will then lock all the axes. That's how we scale it uniformly and type in something ridiculously large, like one 10,000 or even a hundred thousand and leave it like that. So now we have our HRI. Let's jump back into our skylights and we need to recapture our world because our skylight doesn't know that we changed the sky. So I'm going to come down here all the way down here and click on recapture and boom. Now our skylight is affecting our world. If I select our sky sphere, I'm able to rotate this around, but notice that our HRI isn't updating. That's unfortunate, but we need to click on our skylight. And whenever we do change our sky, make sure you click on the recapture button. Also, just know that while your QMAP is still present from last time, it's not being used. We can tell this QMAP isn't being used because it's grayed out. Let's go into SLS specify QMAP and click on this arrow to get rid of it. And then jump back into SLS captured scene just to get a point across that we're not directly taking the light information from the HGRI. Instead, we're getting that light information from our actual material which just so happens to be using our texture. So let's double click on our HRI instance. And within details, make this just a little bit bigger, select our skylight. That's so we have access to recapture everything. Down here, you see that I'm able to increase the intensity. And while I increase the intensity and recapture, our scene gets a lot brighter or decrease this to 0 0.5. Recapture, our scene definitely gets dimmer. So leave that one, access to that contrast. So increase that contrast, maybe make those clouds more noticeable and click on recapture for that. So that's a gist of using HGRIs within Unreal Engine. Now Unreal Engine does come with a really neat actor. If we go to settings, plugins, and type in HGRI, I encourage you to check out the HGRI backdrop if you are interested in mostly lighting with HGRIs. But as I said beforehand, generally for my Unreal scenes, I like to stick with my sky and atmosphere because they're just amazing. And now it is finally time to create a shrine to the Blender monkey head. We have all the skills we need. But before we jump into that environment, if you are interested in learning how to program in Unreal Engine, it is a wormhole. But I have another tutorial that should be up there. I recommend even if you don't plan on creating games in Unreal Engine, to still learn how to program using blueprints because you can create tools that will help you in your environment design process. So without further ado, let's create the shrine. All right, so to begin, we're starting from complete scratch for this project. So open up Unreal Engine 5 and select games, a blank project and project location, desktop, that's fine. I do want easy access to this project folder. And for project name, call this one monkey shrine tutorial. We don't need starter content. We can leave it at ray tracing and we're only using blueprint but we're not even going to be programming for this project and press create. Now we're going to have to download some assets from the Epic Games Marketplace. And the asset is specifically called Megascan Goddess Temple. You can just type that in right here in search and you're going to want to download it and create a project. This is an amazing environment created by Quixels and Epic Games. And it comes with a bunch of custom assets and also some Megascan assets. This is pretty helpful because we're going to use all the assets available there. And we don't have to manually download each of these Epic Games assets from Bridge. We can just download this project as a whole. Also, I highly recommend you check out on the Quixel YouTube channel, the creation of this goddess temple. Because it's always fun to see the thought process of an experienced artist. And you can learn some great tips. So once you do have this downloaded, create a project. I'm going to save this on my desktop. And we can leave the name as is because the name doesn't matter since we will be migrating these assets over. 
for the version, we're going to select four, and that's because we're going to update an Unreal Engine 4 project to Unreal Engine 5 and create. Once you've created the Goddess Temple project, you want to open up its project folder. And before you double click to open it, we need to switch it from Unreal Engine 4 to Unreal Engine 5. We can do that by right clicking and switch Unreal Engine versions. Right now it's 4.26. Simply select 5. You should see 5 if you do have Unreal Engine 5 downloaded. And press OK. Double click. If this is your first time opening this project, then you're going to have to wait a bit for the shaders to compile. But once they do, do not worry about this level right now. This level is kind of broken since we did upgrade from Unreal Engine 4 to Unreal Engine 5. We will not be going over how to convert a map since we're only opening up this project right now to grab those assets and bring it into our main project. So press Control Space and I want to select everything. So select the first one, hold down Shift and select the last folder, right click. Select Migrate. It's pretty much going to grab everything that's within this project. That's what we want. Press OK. And now we need to navigate to the location of our Monkey Shrine project. So as a shortcut to find its location, we're going to right click on our Monkey Shrine project. Go to Show and Explore. And simply copy its location up here. And then paste its location of its content folder there. And press Select Folder. It's copying all of those files from the Megascans project into our own project and it says content migration complete successfully within our main project we can see that we do have all of those folders we need to migrate some more assets into our project and specifically it's a downloadable assets link in the description below if you haven't already downloaded them and it is the monkey shrine asset project so put this up open up the project and within here control and space select monkey shrine folder right click Migrate just like beforehand. And we're going to navigate to the same location. Luckily, we do have it in our clipboard. Now we can exit out of the Monkey Shrine Asset Project. And we can see that we do have that folder. And included is a landscape we're going to use. And of course, the Monkey Shrine itself. Now that we have all the assets that we want, you could delete the Megascans Goddess Temple if you want to, because this is 12 gigabytes large. And we no longer need it. Since we finally have all the assets that we need, let's start making the map. So in our monkey shrine is pretty much where I'm going to be saving all my custom assets. So let's create a new folder, call this one maps. And within here, a level from scratch, monkey shrine map. Go into it, save selected. It is a completely blank level. So we're going to need to create a landscape for us. I'm going to leave it at the default values right now and press create. Now we don't see anything, so let's add in a sun, come to create, light, directional light, move this one up. Our project is going to be completely dynamic, so make sure our lights are set to movable. And also, if you don't have world settings, come up to windows, select world settings, and within world settings, just so that we don't accidentally bake our lights, come down into light mass and in advance, click on force no pre-computed lighting. Obviously our world is missing a sky. So create visual effects and our trusty sky and atmosphere. Just place that in there, select our sun, go to details and link it up with our sky and atmosphere by selecting sky and atmosphere right there and turning it on. Now to fill the half black void, we will add in some fog. So visual effects, exponential height fog, drag that in. And we do have that issue again, where we hold down control and L to move our sun. If we lower our sun's angle, our fog is pretty emissive, so we need to go into product settings, go to all settings, type in height fog, and make sure support sky atmosphere effect height fog is set to true, but before you restart, so don't restart just yet, kill two birds with one stone, type in virtual textures, and make sure you enable virtual textures, and restart. When our project has restarted, jump back into our monkey shrine map. And we are going to be having that issue whenever we open up our project. I pretty much want to just edit our monkey shrine map. I don't want to create any new levels, which is what Unreal does by default. So we could go into our project settings. And then under maps and mode, we could set our editor startup map to the monkey shrine. Right there. So now whenever we restart our editor, we're going to end up in this map. So we don't have to click on it again. x metro height fog for fog and scattering color. Bring this all the way to black. 
And if we lower our sun once again, that issue is the directional in scattering. So also lower this all the way to pitch black. And now our sun is working pretty successfully. So I'd say we're not done just yet. I'm going to create shapes and just add in a reference cube for now. And luckily for us, the goddess temple asset does come with a human reference. So we don't have to add in the mannequin to get a human reference. Instead, we're going to go to content, type in human and SM underscore human reference. Just place them there like that. We are almost done with our lighting, but you probably noticed that our sky isn't emitting any light. So as hopefully you could guess by now, come to create lights and drag in a skylight. Within the details panel, make sure it's set to movable. And since we're capturing a sky and atmosphere, real time capture is turned on. And for one last adjustment, come to create visual effects and we're going to add in volumetric clouds to give some variation for our world because our sky was looking pretty boring. And at this point, you could pat yourself on the back because we are done lighting our scene. That was all we had to do. The only changes we're going to make is just angling our sun at different directions with control and L. At this point, we're going to add in a landscape material and that landscape material is included within our monkey shrine. Auto landscape and it is MI underscore landscape shrine. If we open this up, we can see that it is a fairly advanced landscape material with a lot of different options and a lot of different landscape layers that we can use. Scrolling all the way down here, open up the parent. We can actually see what is happening. Now I do have an entire video that goes over what all these settings do in detail and an entire tutorial series that goes over how to create individual features. So if you are interested, you could check those out. But for the sake of time, I'm just including this material here so that our tutorial isn't another five hours long. Before we add our landscape, we need to fill out some of those parameters. So let's go into content drawer and my underscore landscape and just dock it right here within the content drawer. We're going to fill in some of these textures, which are just using Unreal's default textures right now with some of the textures that are included within the goddess temple. So go to surfaces and rock cliff layered. We're going to drag in the color for a actually ignore displacement. For roughness, we'll go right there. And normal, go right there. B is already filled out. For C, go back to surfaces. We are going to use Icelandic stony ground. Base color, roughness, and normal. And then for D, surfaces, quarry. So drag it right there. And right there. And roughness. Now we aren't using the E layer landscape. So if you want to add in another layer, then you can right here, the option is available. But for now, I feel like all this is fine. So jump back into monkey shrine map. Let's save everything and press control space, go into our auto landscape and my underscore landscape monkey shrine, scroll all the way down, plug it up like this, jump into our landscape editing mode and go to paint. And we see that we have material underscore blend as our first layer. Create a weight blended layer of normal. And right here, we just leave it as default for where it's going to be stored. Select that layer. And it already filled out our entire scene with that layer. If we go into sculpt and start sculpting, we can see why this first layer is pretty unique. And that is we do have some automatic texturing. So on really sharp angles, it's going to use a cliff texture because oftentimes grass doesn't grow on really sharp angles. Real quickly, I find Unreal's auto exposure to be pretty annoying. So we're going to turn it off by good by jumping back into place actors mode and adding in a post process volume. Make sure infinite extent unbound is turned on and all the way up here for exposure. Let's change it to manual and increase that size to let's go 11 for now and maybe raise our sun. Okay, there we go. Before we move on, we need to add in some trees. So to get the trees, open up your Epic Games launcher and in the marketplace, type in temperate vegetation spruce forest. This is a free asset, so you need to download it. 
and you also need to add it to project. So click on add to project and make sure show all projects is enabled. And now if you type in monkey, we're going to do monkey shrine tutorial, which is the name of our current project. And it says asset is not compatible with unreal engine five. So we need to select 4.26. Essentially what's happening is that this asset hasn't been updated for unreal engine five, which kind of makes sense. It's pretty new. So we're going to be using the 4.26 versions and add to project. Once your trees are in your project, go to content drawer and we should see PN underscore interactive spruce forest under meshes, full, high, we get some trees, low, we get some trees and all our trees are in separate folders right now. If you want to see all the static meshes that are located within this specific folder, then we need to filter it out by going to add filters and static mesh. So these are all the trees that are included. If we ever want to get back our normal folder view, then just uncheck the filter. So filter to get all the static meshes, uncheck to get our folders back. To begin, I only want to paint the really large trees. So all of these, and then afterwards, we're going to handle these smaller ones because we want to do the big detail first and then the small detail later, because big detail is more important than little set decorations. So I'm going to drag this out and make sure that our trees are working right now. Because after all, this wasn't made for Unreal Engine 5. This was made for Unreal Engine 4. Wait for the shaders to compile. This might take a while. Okay, so our tree is looking pretty nice. There are no glitches. Just know in UE5 Early Access, there is a glitch with foliage where it does start to flicker. If your foliage is flickering, then the way you fix this is to simply select your mesh, go into the Material Instance of your leaves, and turn off Wind. So that is one way you could fix it but it looks like we aren't having that issue right now. Also, whenever you do drag in a new tree, then we're gonna have to wait for that tree's shaders to compile. A way we get around that is if we look at P underscore interactive spruce forest, it does include a map and this map already contains all the meshes. So you can open up a map with the assets that you wanna use. Unreal will compile everything at once and we don't have to worry about having to compile them in the middle of a work session. So for example, you might have this issue, and that is if we do drag in a goddess temple asset, then we're going to have to wait for that asset to compile. So just to get everything out of the way right now, let's go into maps and select Roman cave, which is our main map of the goddess temple. And it looks like it didn't ask us to compile, but it might ask you to compile. And you're just going to have to wait for everything to compile. And everything is still pretty slow at this point. So let's go back into our main map. And let's start building. So at this point, we're going to handle some of the large details first and then slowly escalate down until we handle smaller and smaller details. Because after all, what matters for the main composition are those large shapes. So we do have in Monkey Shrine a monkey statue that we can drag out. This is just this Suzanne monkey head. So let's move this one right there. And we can see its size compared to the human reference right there. So obviously, maybe this is a little bit too big. Also, I'm gonna turn off snapping. And let's scale this down maybe to 0 0.5. Okay, half its original size. And I do want this monkey head to be a little bit elevated. So jump into our landscape mode and just paint a slight elevation. Again, all of these sculpts are gonna be insanely rough right now. We're going to keep on iterating over this process and decrease the size. Kind of sculpt a ledge going up to it. And I do also want some stairs with the monkey head. So we're going to go into our mega scans, type in stairs and filter out for static meshes. So I want these stairs right here and also these stairs. I'm going to move them off to the side. Let's move this down. And also, whenever I'm making an edit to a static mesh, you'll see me sporadically press Control and B, find where that static mesh is or maybe two static meshes, select them and enable nanites. Generally, whenever I'm using a static mesh, I'm going to enable nanites unless it's foliage because it gives us more detail. We don't have to worry about LODs 
and it just makes our game run a lot smoother. So let's move this and let's do, hold on, Alt, maybe two of them side by side. Right there. And do some going up to it like this. Into Sculpt, we can flatten out with a flatten brush. So the general composition of this scene will be facing towards the monkey head. So I imagine that this is a very ancient shrine. People have been visiting this monkey head over thousands of years, giving gifts, relics, food, because after all, who wouldn't want to worship Suzanne? And I need to move out and move back in because we were having some shadow artifacts. That's just a fluke of Unreal Engine 5 at this moment. If you do have shadow artifacts, you move really far away and then move back up close to get rid of them. I also want our monkey head to kind of be in a little valley. So that's what I'm going to do right now is just sculpt around a valley. So I'm trying to find a nice elevation with a sculpt brush. And once I do find that elevation that I like, then I'm going to use the flatten brush to create that valley. So for example, right here, I think at this point is a good elevation. So going to flatten with my tool strength at one. If I left click and hold at the direct elevation I want, which is right here, then we're able to start paying out a new elevated level to our landscape. So I could just paint around the monkey head just like this. And now we have a valley. Press Ctrl and Z because I want to give more space for the monkey head. If you don't like your sculpt, you can always go back in and change it. Actually, maybe we can decrease the size of the elevation. So go to Sculpt, hold on Shift to make an indent in the world. Then go to Flatten. And see what this one looks like. So at very sharp angles on landscapes, you will notice some weird deforming, especially right here. That's because if we go to Alt 2, that's the dynamic level of detail that's on the landscape itself. That's kind of glitching out because this is a 90 degree angle. We don't necessarily have to worry about that at this point since we are going to be covering the sides right here with actual static meshes. Because this texture stretching looks terrible, and landscapes generally shouldn't be 90 degrees. If you do have the option, you would want to replace your landscape with a nanite mesh. After I switch modes, we are seeing that issue with the artifacts. So I go really far away, and the shadows just fix themselves. So let's grab this human because he is about to get engulfed in our landscape. Move him out here. Also move the tree off to the side. We are going to paint trees in just a bit. But before we do that, we need to go over the last technical bit of information. And that is setting up our virtual textures. The reason why I waited this long until we set up the virtual textures is because I want to know the main area where everything's going to be built and where all our static meshes are. Since I know it's right here, this is where we should probably put our texture volumes. So volumes, type in virtual, and drag out runtime virtual texture. Increase the scale on the z-axis, maybe 5,000. And increase it in x, 10,000. Or maybe 12,000. Copy that there. And just encompass the majority of my level just like that. We need to add some runtime virtual textures, but lucky for us, I believe there's already some virtual textures that we can take. Located within masters, 04 underscore RVT. So we're gonna use RVT underscore material properties and RVT underscore world height. 
the reason why we're using these runtime virtual textures without creating our own virtual textures by going to materials and textures is because these are already linked with a lot of the static meshes we're going to be using. And if we did create our own virtual textures, then we're going to have to relink them, go into all the material instances, and that could just be a huge hassle. So I'm going to drag, let's go RVT underscore material properties right there. And press control W to duplicates and height right there. Now we need to select our landscape and tell our landscape that we want to use those virtual textures. So under virtual textures, click on the plus two times and add in our RVT right there and right there. And we can already see a height map and a base color telling us that this is working because when I made this landscape material, I included a runtime virtual texture output. All right, let's see if our virtual textures are working by zooming in on this mesh right here. And ideally we should start to see a blend and we aren't seeing any blend with the ground. So let's open up our material instance and see what is wrong. And just by looking at our material instance, I think I noticed we don't see any properties for virtual textures. So let's go into our standard master. And this is the problem. We do not have virtual textures here. And this is why I included within the monkeys auto landscape MF underscore VT ground blend. So just drag this in. This is the same material function that we did move into the previous project that gives us the ability to blend with our virtual textures. But before we hook it up with this material, double click on it to open up the material function. And we need to set the virtual textures right here. So select texture color and go back into our masters RBT. We're using this one. So drag it onto that slot for the bottom, drag it there like this, press apply and in M underscore standard master, you'll notice that our function is asking for material attributes and we don't have any material attribute here. So we're going to have to create one by right clicking and typing in make material attributes just like that. So what I'm going to do is just move this. That's how it's right above our node output and hold down control and then drag from it and place it there. So hold down control, take this metallic wire and put it into the metallic of our material attributes. So control drag won't break a link. It'll just allow us to move that link around. So do roughness right there and normal right here like this. And instead of asking for individual channels, we're just going to go use material attributes and we have a nice spot where we can just lock up our material function just like that. Press apply. And now with our monkey shrine immediately, everything is working great. Move this around and we can see that it is working. Just as a reminder, if your virtual textures are glitching out, then come up to build, build all levels and make sure since this is a dynamic map, force no pre-computer lighting is turned on. So let's see what options we have. And it's the same options that we went over previously within the virtual texture section. I think a better way to demo what these actually do is by unchecking remove sides. And if I bring my blend fall off length all the way down to zero, we can see what our height does. Our height controls where we want our blend to be and the fall off controls how soft we want that blend to end. Then just know if for some reason you don't like the blend of a specific mesh, then you could play with the settings here and make sure remove sides is turned on because otherwise we get nasty texture stretching, something we don't want. And I'm looking at this cliff right here. We are going to fill it, so don't worry. And I think we're ready to start painting some trees. But before we do, make sure we save everything. So save all. And let's exit out of all those windows. And real quickly, let's paint a really rough dirt path. So go into our landscape, paint, and we're going to create a bunch of layer blends. So weight blend a layer, save. And right here for material C, also save this one. 
and for material D, save that one right there. Also going to sculpt. Let's flatten this out because I want to be able to draw a path from the monkey head veering down here to the right. Paint. And let's start painting. So bring down the tool strength just a little bit. Okay, press Control Z because we were accidentally painting the cliff texture, which we don't want. And we want this gravel texture right here. Okay, that's a lot better. Let me bring down the texture just a little bit more. We can also hold down Shift to take away a specific layer if maybe you do have too much of that layer on. And slowly start to veer just like that. Go to dirt. Maybe add just a little bit of dirt on the side. Also, I'm going to sculpt, flatten. I want to move this elevation to the side. Here we go. Slowly starting to come together. Baby steps. Jump into foliage. And let's drop some of the big trees in there. PN underscore interactive spruce forest. Meshes, static meshes. Let's select all of these right here and simply drop them like that. Now we are going to most likely have to play with the density right now because I'm gonna imagine that if I just paint it as is. Yeah, yep, it's a little bit too dense. So press Control Z and with all these selected with Control and A for our density instead of 100, make that one. Even one is a little bit too much, but we could just leave it as is. And just deselect some of the trees. So I think for these really tall trees, we can deselect three of them. So we're no longer painting. And. Okay, that looks good. But I think I'm just not going to paint any of the really tall trees for now. And we're just going to stick with these really thick trees. Because I do want these thick trees to be at the very front. And then we can have some of the taller trees be at the back. But this size compared to the human, I think I'm going to decrease the size also. So for scale X, let the size be randomly from 50%, so 0 0.5 to 0 0.7. Okay, that's a better size. So let's start painting some of the trees. But we will have an issue when we're painting trees on landscapes. And that is, if we have a hill with angles, our trees are angled like this. And trees, generally, they don't grow like that. Instead, they grow straight up. So press Control Z all the way down here. Uncheck Align to Normal. And now we get more realistic tree placement. So up here, we're going to paint around. And decrease that paint density. Just a little bit of trees on the second elevation. And you do notice that when we go far away, our trees turn into textures. Pressing Alt 2, you can kind of see what is happening. And that is we go from actual real geometry to just a flat plane that approximates what the tree would look like. Because ideally, we don't want to render an entire tree when we're super far away and we can't tell the difference between a texture and a 3D model. If you don't want that to happen, then we can use a console command. If you ever know clipped in a game, then you probably know what a console command is. But down here, we can select that and we get access to manually specify some extra settings that Unreal doesn't expose by default. So if we type in foliage dot force, we can select with the up arrow force LOD and then simply type zero like that. So now we no longer have any level of details. 
If we press Alt and 2, that geometry will remain super dense throughout. So just know that that is an option, but of course it's going to come at the cost of performance. If we ever want to get back our original settings with the level of detail, then press the up arrow as a shortcut. That's so we don't have to type in Polish.force LED again. And instead of zero, type negative one, which is Unreal's default. And we do get back that level of detail. So know that that is an option. Now I think it's time to finally handle the clips right here. And we will come back to painting more foliage as we add more. But these cliffs are looking pretty bad. So let's try to find a replacement static mesh. And if we come into, let's go, mega scans and static meshes to see all the static meshes available, actually go into 3D assets and then see our static meshes. We can drag out some cliffs. So we have this as an option. Let's see what else we have. Okay, that seems like all right there. We also have some more under custom assets. So we have this little rock. This rock is great because whenever we are working with assets, there's going to be some holes, especially if we're kit bashing. So we can just fill a hole in with this rock that is the same color as our cliffs, which makes it look natural. And we also have that right there. And right there like that. And notice how automatically lowering this into my ground actually we need to move it a bit more closer because when it was outside right there when we got this texture stretching that tells us that we're outside of our runtime virtual texture bounds so if i select that we can see that we are just barely outside it so if you do get texture stretching then you want to move asset into it but our models automatically blend with the landscape and it's just working by default. That's because we are using the same runtime virtual textures that was included within the goddess assets. So before we start kit bashing our cliffs, let's select these, press Control and B, right click, and enable nanites. So let's select these right here, Control B, find where they are, enable nanites, and select these ones right here and enable nanite on them and save everything. At this point, I'm going to take my cliffs, hold down alt and move them. That's how they are adjacent to the sharp edges of my landscape. Also, let's go into local space because for instances like this, that should be helpful and simply scale it down or just scale it. That's how it blends well with the landscape. So just like that. All right, so at this point, there is an issue with our virtual textures. If we go into Alt 4, we can see that if we go far away, our virtual textures just stop working. And of course, we're going to fix this by building our level. And now that issue is fixed. Also, when it comes to holes right, right here, press Control and Space. And let's go into our custom assets and drag out this beautiful small rock. Just place it here and fill up any location you don't like. Just like that. And you probably noticed so far, especially if we go into Unlit, that all these rocks have different colors right now. And we will adjust their colors within the material parameters in just a bit. But until we do that, let's continue filling up the side right here.
right here we do notice another hole so i'm trying to patch it up with this little mesh right here so let's see if i can do this if not then i'm just going to duplicate and move a rock Another thing I'm doing is just slightly elevating the grass. That's how it slightly goes up. And then we hit the cliff because we don't want to have sharp 90 degree angles between our landscape and rocks. Okay, great. Our monkey shrine is starting to look nice, but pressing Alt and 4, the colors of our rocks are pretty unnatural at this point. So what I'm going to do is come through and let's open up some of these rocks materials. Drag the material instance details panel and start to play with their colors to kind of get our rocks to stop looking so brownish and to look more orangey like this rock right here. I do like the color. So Let's try to play with this, maybe decrease the contrast and also increase the desaturation just a little bit and then play with the color overlay. Notice how when we change the tint, nothing happens and that's because we need to increase the overlay strength right here. So now we can see that between value of 0 1, I control the strength. So let's try 0 0.5, a very faint overlay. And then we can try to move it. Let's go right here ish. Here we go. Now, this specific rock blends in better with this rock right here. So let's try it on this texture. And for some of the other rocks. All I'm doing at this point is opening up the material instance and playing with the parameters until I get something that looks nice and helps it blend in with the other rocks right next to it. Before we move on, let's handle some more big details and we're going to have to download a special mesh. So let's go to Quixel Bridge and this is one of my favorite assets including in Bridge. Type in Icelandic Volcano Terrain. And it is this one right here. You want to download it. I just download it as a medium quality. And then add to our project by clicking on that button right there. So let's see where this is in Mega Scans, Static Meshes drag this out here we have it and this is a pretty large mesh this mesh is perfect for those large background mountains so just place it like that and from viewing angle it gives some variety to our horizons <laughs> because without this mesh when we look out to the horizon it just abruptly ends so we do want to fill that up
let's start to paint some more trees. And this time let's paint some of the larger, taller trees and see what it looks like from the perspective on the ground. I just think these trees are too big. So go from a minimum 0.5 and a max 0.7, just like beforehand. Okay, more reasonable. Press Control and Z a bunch of times because I did forget to turn off Align to Normal. So come all the way down here and uncheck Align to Normal. And now our trees are bending in weird directions. Actually, they are still bending, and that's because we need to select those trees in the Fulge Editor and then uncheck Align to Normal. We can always come in here with the select tool and start to manually move around trees to get some very precise placement. Also, if you ever want to change the color of a tree, then you want to go into your trees, meshes, select a tree's color you want to change. So let's say right here, and then you want to select the leaf. You can also see where each material is located on your mesh by clicking on the highlight. And if we click on this highlight, obviously this are the leaves. So double click on that. And within details panel, we have a leaf tint. So we can see if we come out here, I'm able to drastically change the color of those leaves. <laughs> okay, so obviously it's this tree right here, but I'm pressing control Z because that's just an example where if you do not like that color, then you can't change it. I'm gonna work on the stairs now and add some pillars, but before we do that, our stairs aren't really aligned. So move them just a little bit. Move this one backwards. Also, we need to go into sculpt mode. Flatten so that the stairs are actually going to lead up to a height location right there and just a little bit of smoothing. All right, really start to come along right now. And over here, we do have this stairs. The stair is located within 3D assets and castle stairs. So I want to use the side of the stair specifically right here to place it at the side of these two stairs. But unfortunately for us, it's not just one sided, we have two sides. So if I do place one right there and one right here, then we have this middle ground, which I really don't want. So we're able to make some really quick edits to our three assets and cut them in half using Unreal's 3D modeling tools. So just like in Blender, Unreal, you can 3D model, but obviously it's not as good as Blender. And I only 3D model in Unreal Engine for really quick edits, such as this right now. So to activate 3D modeling, come into plugins, select all, and simply type in model and modeling tools editor mode enabled. And we're gonna have to restart. Here we are back in the editor. And now we have a new mode up here called activate modeling. Let's select that. And we're gonna use the plane cut tool. So down here we have plane cut. And now we can rotate this. Let's go rotate in the X and just do a really rough cut. I don't need to be accurate at all at this point. I'm just trying to get one of the sides. So let's grab this side right here and press accept. I do have an entire tutorial that you could check out where we 3D model Blender Guru's donut, but in Unreal Engine. So check that out. If you do want to go into more depth into some of these tools, and let's use the pivot tool right here to move our pivot since that's in the middle and I want it to be in the middle of our geometry. Moving the pivot is very similar to setting an origin point for a Blender 3D object. And now we have a nice side that I can place right here and scale up just like this. 
Also, hold down Alt and move it. If we ever want to flip a static mesh, you can scale it on the x-axis just like that. And move this one down there. Okay, it looks like we're having some virtual texture issues again. If I come up pretty close, it looks nice. But when I go farther away, the texture quality goes down dramatically. So build all levels. And that did fix it. Alright, so now that I like my stairs, let's select all of these and scale them up a little bit in the z-axis. Also, just make sure that the stairs are both aligned. Duplicate all of them. And replace the other stairs right here with these stairs. And let's exit out of modeling mode. Now, press control space. Let's go into mega scan static meshes. Find some pillars. So if we go here, type in Roman, we should see it. Okay, so we have a Roman column. Roman column 03. I'm just dragging them all out to see what we have. And we have this Roman floor. This Roman floor is really nice because it should be blending in with the ground, but looks like it's not. So let's open this up and see what the issue is. Blend Z bias is zero. So let's reset them and just increase it. Okay, here we go. Now the blend is looking a little bit nicer. The reason why there was an issue was because was because this texture blend comes with the goddess assets. So it's not our custom function, which meant that the parameters are a little bit different to what we're used to, but that's fine. So these assets are really great for giving some stone tiles. And real quickly, let's type in human. Amberine in a human reference. Click on content to search for everything. And so we have a nice scale to go by. Place this person here. Also, let's select this Roman tile and enable nanites for these right here. I think, I think this left one would be really good as some general columns that we can place around. Also, we could delete these and maybe you want a broken column. You can use this one right here, but I kind of want my columns to stand for now. So let's move that one up, select our person, see the scale. And that does seem like a pretty good scale. So maybe duplicate this. Let's go three right here. And maybe have, let's have two up at the top. Right there, one at each monkey head. Rotate these around to give them a little bit of variation. Also, maybe even flip them. Okay, it does look like the bottom is filled. To change them just a little bit more. And let's enable nanites. So press control B, enable nanites. And save everything because I do want to use this column right here. But when I enable nanite, Unreal crashes. So I'm not going to enable nanite on this specific mesh. I don't really know why, but it's kind of expected since at the time of recording, Unreal Engine 5 is in early access. But I want two really large pillars just at the back of the monkey. So let's go one right there, hold on Alt, and one right here. Let's duplicate these tiles. Move them over here. Bring them down onto the floor. Some nice variation. And while we're at it, let's give an edge to our road. 
So move these off to the side. Let's jump back into our 3D asset file, type in stairs, and we're gonna grab these one right here. Enable nanites. And I'm gonna lower this down. Hold down Alt to drag out another stair. And let's rotate this one 90 degrees. Just like this. Turn off snapping. And now if we place both of these together. Kind of scale them like this. We see now we have sort of like a concrete barrier that we can rotate and place off to the side. Just like that. Hold on Alt and place these off to the side like that. And just as a reminder, you can always change the color of your static meshes by opening up their material instances and change it right here. So I think the intensity is a bit too bright for this one. So just bring it down to let's go 0.4. Also lighting, see what different shadows look like with control and L. Or just when it's completely pitch black. But let's go a little bit to the side, left side. And I like seeing some tree shadows. Now let's work on the sides. Because the sides are looking pretty bland. So maybe we can add a static mesh, go to custom assets. And a good one right here is SM underscore quarry 03. So let's just try to rotate this. And go into local mode. That's us easier to rotate. Move this one up. And let's try SM underscore 04. Okay, this one seems like a pretty good mesh. Let's cover up this hole right here. to find another asset okay so maybe this one right here we can place to the side and let's select all these new static meshes press ctrl b to find where they are right click and of course we're going to enable nanites because might as well and especially since these meshes are overlapping and nanite cuts the geometry that's how if we don't see the geometry it's not going to render which drastically increases our performance and it looks like our virtual textures aren't working so we're going to open up its material instance we're going to have to adjust the texture blend right here let's duplicate these meshes to the other side and also handle these sides right here There we go. Also know that we can jump into our landscape mode, paint. And for some reason, maybe you don't want the auto landscape to be right here and you just want this entire hill to be grass. Then you can select the grass layer and then just paint over that auto landscape like that. So know that that is an option. So for example, right here, you could paint over this and make it kind of grassy. But I'm pressing Control Z and just leave it as is for now. And build level to fix our virtual textures. I noticed that right here, this geometry looks like it's kind of floating. So we need to fix that. And let's grab in custom assets, SM underscore quarry. Rotate this one around. 
and simply slam it into our cliff like that. Looks a little bit nicer. And let's add some geometry to our road right here. So we already did a little bit of that with these Roman tiles right here. The goddess temple asset comes with some really nice rocks. Go to mega scans, type in Icelandic. And here we have a bunch of meshes. We could drag this out right there. So that's one option. And let's drag these right here and scale them down because they are pretty big. Here is another option. Now what I'm gonna do is come through each of these material instances, fix them up a bit, make sure that the virtual textures are working and scour them around the dirt path and my landscape in general to give my landscape more geometry and detail. Okay, I've decided that I don't like the way that the virtual texture parameters are set up for this material. So let's just replace this with our own function. This part is optional. If you do think the parameters are fine, then you don't have to follow along. Press control space. Let's go into our monkey shrine assets. Auto landscape, drag in our function. And it looks like that the top here is our main material and the bottom is our blend material. So we're going to hook it up like this right there and maybe right there like that. So let's see if this works. Okay, there we go. And everything's just working by default. So we don't need all these nodes and you can leave those nodes not inside of there, but I'm just doing this to clean stuff up. We don't need these nodes and all of this down here we don't need and this texture sample highlight all those we can bring them a little bit closer and everything seems to be working press apply let's start scattering Just because we added that function in doesn't mean we're not going to still play with the parameters because all the way up here, I want to decrease this one's intensity. So let's go 0 0.5 and also maybe decrease the blend right here. So make the fall off just a little bit smaller and the virtual height just a little bit smaller. Also do the same thing for this one right here. Also, let's not forget to select all these meshes and press control B, enable nanites. I need to come in here with a very, very faint brush. Let's go 0 0.1 and then raise the landscape because beforehand we weren't completely covering our stairs. So at this point, you pretty much have most of the skills and knowledge needed to complete this environment build. And there's one last thing we need to go over, and that is ropes. So I'm going to drag out a rope right now. 
and ropes are pretty unique in that their spline very similar to blender's bevier curves so if we come all the way over here let's grab a human reference and move that right next to our rope since our rope is a little bit too big right now and move that right there move this down and we're going to have to scale this down make sure that you are not in game view so press the g key and we can see that we have two points on each side if we select this point and move it around rotate it we can see exactly what this is this is just like blender's curves we also need to increase this so right here for spawn length make this 47 and select that one right there also move this one out and rotate it to see what's happening so this is pretty unique we can also hold down alt and create a brand new point. So hold down Alt and then rotate this point and so on. Actually, let's make this one 40. You can delete a point by pressing the delete key. And that's the basics of how splines work in Unreal. And move it. That's how it's connected to the monkey head because I want ropes to be dangling connected to the monkey head to the cliff because Really no reason, except I think it looks nice. So move that there. And let's select here. Make this just a little bit bigger. Okay, now I have some dangling ropes. But the issue is I want to go far away. Maybe it's not noticeable through YouTube compression, but there is a level of detail on this rope. Now, unfortunately, we cannot use Nanite to get rid of level detail because this geometry is dynamic in that we're able to move it. So instead, we're going to double click on our static mesh and we're just going to get rid of our LODs by scrolling all the way down here to number of LODs. Set this from 5 to 1 and then click on apply changes and this will get rid of all of our LODs. We can visualize our LODs up here by clicking on our LOD auto and we can see that this is our maximum and this is our least. Obviously, that's not really that much geometry. So if we click on apply changes, now we see that we only have one level of detail and that's just our main mesh. So let's get out of all these, press apply. And if we move far away, we can see that we don't have any LODs. This is the best geometry possible, making our ropes noticeable. Now I'm just gonna copy and paste this rope around and create several dangling layers. Before we move on to the small and medium sized detail, I highly encourage you to not follow exactly what I'm doing, but create your own environment, create your own world and story. Because when you do get the hang of it, Unreal is kind of like Legos, where we get a bunch of pieces and it's up to us to decide how we want to combine those pieces and create something brand new. So I'm going to jump into my foliage tool and I want to start painting some ferns. Now I know we do have some really nice ferns within mega scans and 3d plants static meshes see everything we have we're going to start with the ferns and then use some of the really smaller meshes later select these right here so now that those are dragged in let's see how large these are compared to our human so come to paint decrease the brush left click and that scale is not bad at all so i'm going to select my human delete him let's see if we have any other ferns and i also want to use sm underscore tropical plants so foliage let's drag in our tropical plant select all of these and also see what the size is like up here okay that is definitely too big so selecting okay i did not have my tropical plants selected so now that they are selected go 0.5 and 0 0.7 okay that's not bad 
And since our tropical plants are larger than our basic ferns, I'm going to deselect our ferns and only have the tropical plants selected to paint them. So we're going to paint our tropical plants first, and then we will handle our fern later. Let's get rid of the fern that's right here real quickly. So hold on shift, get rid of them. Now uncheck the ferns, make sure only our tropical plants are selected. And on the sides, I'm just going to paint around the monkey mesh. And you might be thinking that this is a little bit too saturated right now. I am definitely thinking that, and we will fix that in just a bit. So come here, select. Actually, instead of 0, let's go 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. Decrease that size just a little bit more. And change our density to 50. The amount of plants you want to use depends on your computer. So if you have a super powerful computer, then feel free to use a lot. But if you have a slower one, then it might slow down performance. Let's open up our tropical plants and double click to open up its details panel. Just as a reminder, if your plants are glitching out, then you can disable the wind effect, which should fix it, which is all the way down here. You can control how much wind we have, but I'm not going to play with this right now since I opened up this instance to adjust our plant's color, because right now, personally, I think this is too saturated. So I'm just going to set everything back to its default value. Let's decrease the color variation because I think it's a little bit too varied right now. I want everything to be a little bit more uniformed. Albedo intensity. Decrease that just a little bit. And for our specular and roughness, maybe increase the roughness. Actually, leave it at one. One is fine. And for our intensity. Okay, I think that might be why our plants are really tense because our subsurface scattering is set to two times what it should be. So let's set it right here for SS intensity to one. And it looks like our plants are looking pretty nice right now. Now let's paint some of the other ferns in. So jump into our foliage and select these ferns. Only have them selected. So let's deselect everything real quickly and then select our ferns. Left click to see what it looks like. And maybe make this its default value. So 1, 1, 1. And maybe a minimum random value from 0 0.8 to 1. Okay, that's better. And I'm only going to paint this onto the side. That's how it kind of looks like. Where we get farther away from the main path, the plants get bigger. But when we get closer, the plants get smaller. And that is too much right now. So maybe go back to 10. Also, this plant is a little bit too bright. So let's go open up this plant static mesh editor. And within here, we're going to open up its details panel, drag it over and adjust some of the settings. For albedo intensity, decrease this to 0 0.7. And for SS intensity, also decrease that just a little bit. Okay, now they blend better together. Now that we completed our large to medium detail, we're going to go over some set dressing. So this might be a little bit of world building right now, but this is a shrine after all. And shrines often have candles right next to each other or like urns with food inside them. So this is why we picked the goddess temple because they already created that for us and they use it within the goddess temple and we're going to use it here. So if we come to custom assets, candles, static meshes, we see we get a bunch of candles. So I'm just going to place little clumps of candles at different locations around this monkey head. And by default, the candles are a little bit too small. So let's increase that size to make it just a little bit bigger. And where's the human for a reference? Okay, now those candles are a little bit too big. So let's move it. Decrease the size. And also, 
we have these urns that we're going to be using. So let's grab this one out. And let's have these hanging ones off to the side for now. Because we will connect them to our ropes up above. And jump into our Mega Scans 3D assets. Here we are. So we have Incense Urn. And a jug. A candle stand. And this wooden plate right here. So for this plate, since I don't want this plate to be dirty, and if we move it close to the ground, then the virtual texture will start to blend with it. Open up the material instance. And simply uncheck use virtual texture blending. Now when we put our asset close to the ground, it's not going to blend with it. Also, we need to do the same thing right here for this candle. So uncheck its virtual textures. And for this cup. All right, so essentially what we're going to do is scatter all these assets around the path leading up to our monkey head. Let's delete the humans. So we no longer need that reference. And real quickly, select all those static meshes. Press Control B to find where they are and activate nanites since this is a tutorial know that i am going pretty fast if this was a normal environment build then i would be more methodical about the placement of my plants and my 3d objects but since we are on a time schedule and this video is probably going to be pretty long to begin with i'm kind of speed running this environment build I could spend days just placing objects, painting, and sculpting. Building environments in Unreal Engine have never been easier. And honestly, it's pretty fun. So at this point, I noticed that some of my textures were really blurry. So then I went into my console commands and I typed in r.streaming pool size and I gave it a really large number. This one is 10,000, but it could be a million. And essentially, it's going to tell Unreal to allocate more space for our textures to avoid that blurriness. So just know that that is a thing. Normally, when that does happen, there'll be a warning up here in the top left hand corner saying texture streaming pool size needs to be changed. Then you come down here and type in r.streaming pool size. But for some reason, it didn't give me that warning, but I did realize that that was probably the issue that was happening at that moment. And over here, let's start to hang some urns from the ropes. And we can do that. So let's go through the assets, static mesh, type in chain. And this chain right here. So this chain will be hanging from one of these ropes. Let's do the top rope in the back. Rotate 90 degrees. And we could grab this static mesh right here. So press Control B 
it's under custom assets incense burner let's select all three of these right click and enable nanite on them same thing with this chain right here so let's enable nanite on that also if you want to be more precise about the length of your chain just dragging that out there let me bring it out we also have one individual metal chain that you can use to create your own custom length for this chain Also, I really like this one. Kind of reminds me of a Christmas ornament. So I also want to place this one right here. If I was taking my time, then I would bother to create a smaller chain length. But I think just, just leaving it like that for now is fine. And hold on, Alt, Duplicate. Actually, let's delete it. Duplicate this with the chain. If I look at the ground, my ground is just a little bit flat. So I'll probably paint some pebbles along this road. And we have more foliage to pick from. So I'll also add in a little bit more foliage. So I want to bring in some rock meshes to my ground to just make the ground a little bit bumpier. And I found these nice rock meshes, but unfortunately they're way too big. So you can watch me try to play with the settings to get a nice size. And since these are static meshes that aren't moving around and they don't have an opacity texture, that means they're perfect for nanite. So don't forget you can enable nanite even though they're technically foliage. Also, we're not just limited to the assets that are currently in our project. Don't forget we have access to 15,000 different assets through Bridge. And we even have a wealth of different assets that you can find on the internet or through the Unreal Marketplace. So feel free to combine different models and styles and see what you could come up with. So notice right here when I go back, our shadows pop in and out, in and out. That's because of the LODs on our trees. We are able to turn off level of detail for our foliage by typing foliage.force LOD and saying that to zero. And now we don't get that popping. But if you do have a lot of foliage in your world and your graphics card isn't that powerful, then we would see a drop in frame rates. Luckily for me, there wasn't that big of a drop. And I'd say at this point, we are pretty much done with our first Unreal Engine 5 environment. You know, it's pretty small, but we do go over a lot of features. And hopefully the skills that you learn throughout this tutorial and this build, you'll be able to apply to your own personal projects completely different from what we just made. But before we go away, this is a little bonus. Let's create a variant of this world, but for night lighting. So let's make a duplication of the current map we're on. Press Ctrl and W to duplicate this. Call this one Monkey Shrine Night Map. Double click to go into it and save selected. That's how we were able to save our original map. So the changes we make now will not destroy that old map. So the vast majority of our lighting will be handled by an HDRI because obviously if this is nighttime or it's about to be nighttime, then we don't have a directional light. So to begin, let's find where our sky and atmosphere is and delete that. Also delete our directional light, our fog, and where is our post-process volume? Press F to jump to it. Let's go into wireframe view mode. That's how we can much easier see what's happening. Move my post-process volume closer to the main area. And now press control and space. 
go into your engine content. If you do not have engine content, then make sure you go to settings and sure engine content is turned on. And let's find where our SM underscore sky sphere is, which is right here. Drag this in because this will be the sphere that holds our HDRI. And luckily for us, the goddess asset already includes an HDRI texture and material we can use. You can find it under masters, a one underscore master. It is this one right here, M underscore HDRI skybox. So we're going to create a material instance of this and actually just leave it as is. Drag it onto it just like that. So let's open up this material instance, see what options we have. And the options are pretty self-explanatory. We can tint it. We can control the brightness right here. We can control the contrast. They even add a desaturation. And we can rotate it by selecting your sky sphere and rotating it like normal. Now, obviously, the sky sphere is a little bit too small. So up here, scale, click that icon right there to lock it for uniform scale and type in something large like 10,000. Now, unfortunately, it did take me a while to figure this out. But the reason why we have black clouds right now is because we forgot to delete our clouds. So delete our volumetric clouds. And now our HRI looks nice. So we see we do have an issue with our skylight. That's because we need to click on our skylight and uncheck real-time capture. We are no longer using a sky and atmosphere. And now our skylight is illuminating our world. Pressing Alt and 4, our virtual textures aren't working. So let's build all levels. Now, for some reason, our runtime virtual texture volumes broke when we duplicate our map. So we need to type in runtime virtual texture, select one of them, go to where our virtual textures are located under masters 04 underscore RVT, drag right there for material, and then drag another one for world heights. And now let's build our level. And that seemed to have fixed our virtual textures. So now. Let's start working on our lighting, select the sky and see what options we have. So within the details panel, we can control the brightness and the contrast. I found a value of 1.2 to be a pretty good contrast. Also, whenever you do change a value of your sky, you need to make sure you go into your skylights, scroll all the way down and click on recapture. Also, you could increase your skylight's intensity separate from the actual intensity of your sky HDRI right here under intensity scale. So maybe a value of two. I think two is pretty good. These are settings I found to look good. Of course, you can do a different setting if you think something else looks better. And we can rotate our sky around. I want to rotate it. That's how the sun is kind of at the back of the monkey head. And at this point, you could say it's done. This is a night or morning lighting setup, but we have these candles. Let's light them on fire. Come to create lights and a simple point light. Move that up. So that point light is way too bright just for some candles. So maybe four or we can have it be three. The lighting is too sharp. Increase the source radius to get softer and softer shadows. Maybe right there. And play with the temperature because this light is pure light. Normally flames and torches, they're orangey. So bring down that temperature to, let's go somewhere around 4000 and set this to movable. So let's duplicate this light over to the other area, candles, and duplicate this to the sides of the monkey head. Just like that. Maybe move this one a little bit closer to the, actually just off to the side. Go into our skylight. And I think maybe the sky's a little bit too intense, so I need to rotate it right there, like this. For a skylight, instead of an intensity of two, maybe 
I think for now, I'll just leave it at two. I might change that later. But zooming in on our candles, we have one issue, and that is we don't have any candle flames. So the goddess temple comes with some candle flames under masters, 01 underscore masters, FX, candle. And we need to first drag in this plane. So this is just a very simple four vertices plane. And the reason why we dragged it in is because we're going to be using it to hold our flame material. So this is kind of confusing. Let's open up our flame material. And within here, the details panel, it is way too bright for us. I need to click on albedo. And this material is pretty interesting in that the brightness is being controlled within the albedo color. And it's the value. So we have a value of 3,500. Bring this to a value of 1. And now we can much better see what that flame is. Maybe a value of 2. Or 4. And that looks pretty good. Press OK. So we're going to select this flame. I need to say that in the case that you're unable to select a flame, that's because you have a transparent selection turned off. To turn back on transparent selection, you need to press the T key. So click on T, and you'll be able to select the flame once again. This is a little bit easier to see within detail lighting mode. Hold on Alt to duplicate. We do not need to place this flame on all the candle wax, just on some of them. And maybe this flame is technically too big for the candle wax, so decrease the size. The shrine is looking pretty scary with this lighting, but I think we could do a better contrast. Since blue and orange are complementary colors, I want to exaggerate the blue that is on top of the monkey head, which is coming from the sky. And to do that, we're going to fake it with a rectangle light. So drag out a rectangle light. Let's see what it is. Maybe increase that size. Also, set to movable. Rotate this 90 degrees. Bit angle like that. And we can see, turn this on and off. You could turn it on and off with the eye icon in the world outliner. Make it a little bit more wider. I want this to be pretty faint, so have give it a value of 2. And then for temperature, increase that a little bit. And also make it just actually... We're only going to be playing with the temperature here. So let's see what this looks like before, after. Put the temperature all the way up to 12,000 so that it is the coldest color possible. So this is before, after. Lightly blue right there. There we go. So we just exaggerated that skylining, but only for one particular part, which is this monkey. And I would say at this point, we are pretty much done. Congratulations for being one of the people to make it to the very end. Before we go, there's one last fun thing I want to point out. And in case you did forget, Unreal Engine 5 is a video game engine. So that means we could run around our world as a character, but we need a character first. So we could get one by pressing Control Space, Add, Add Feature or Content Pack. And we are finally going to use third person for what it's intended for, not just as a human reference. So Add to Project. And we have a new folder. We can see it's called Third Person BP. And within BP is Blueprints. Blueprints is how you program in Unreal Engine. I have an entire separate tutorial you could check out on the channel if you are interested. But we want to use our third person character. Now we can't just drag it in 
and press play because we can see we are not possessing that character. Instead, I'm going to delete third person character, come into world settings, and we have this setting right here called game mode override. In the drop down, we're going to select third person game mode and press play. And congratulations, we now have a walking character in our world. We can walk around, come up to the monkey shrine head. And it is slowing down right now. That's my recording software. And give your praises. Drop some gifts. And hope that the monkey head will bless you on your journeys. And that concludes this lesson. So if you're interested in more Unreal content, make sure to subscribe. Also, I do have a course called the Unreal Masterclass where we take an even deeper dive into Unreal for some more advanced topics. So if you are interested, then make sure to check that out. And with all that being said, have fun.